Stellenbosch University acknowledges its inextricable connection with generations past, present, and future. Stellenbosch University simultaneously acknowledges its contribution towards the injustices of the past. For this, we have deep regret. We apologize unreservedly to the communities and individuals who were excluded from the historical privileges that Stellenbosch University enjoyed and we honor the critical Marty voices of the time who would not be silenced. In responsibility towards the present and future generations, Stellenbosch University commits itself unconditionally to the ideal of an inclusive world-class university in and for Africa. The Rectorate, our keynote speaker, honored guests, and ladies and gentlemen, good morning to all of you. My name is Jerome Topley, and I've been entrusted with the duties of being a host as well as moderator of the sessions, respectively. There's only one rule, except for the ones that I've mentioned, and that is to enjoy yourself. So sit back and relax, and let's welcome and embrace the annual symposium of the social impact. Uh, I have alluded to our program, and let me just run through that quickly. And uh, as you can see, we were starting off with our Rector and Vice-Chancellor's address, followed by the Deputy Rector and Deputy Vice-Chancellor. Also setting the scene will follow, and then we'll have our keynote address. We'll have our Q&A re relative to the keynote address, and have a quick body break of really just five minutes, and we're going to be sticking to that. And as we come back, we'll have our panelists. Um, sharing their problem statements, and we will interact accordingly. And that will be followed by the closing remarks. So without any further ado, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the fore, the Deputy Vice-Chancellor, I beg your pardon, the Vice-Chancellor and the Rector of Stellenbosch University for his delivery, Professor Wim de Villiers. Yeah, I think there he is. Good. There we go. Okay, good. So morning, everyone, and thank you very much for, for attending this uh, Social Impact Symposium. Uh, it's uh, presented in a hybrid format, but and today's theme is, as was stated, is reimagining social impact. Uh, and it is a, it's now a truism, but it, it's, it's so true that the higher education sector is ever changing, it's ever transforming. All right, so let's, let's go again. So during the past two and a half years, We've had to reimagine many aspects of how universities function and operate, especially within the learning and teaching spaces. We've had to become agile and adaptable, and we've had to find ways for our universities not to just survive, but also thrive in times of uncertainty. So that's what we, we were actually able to do that. We were able to reimagine learning and teaching. And also we fast track models of hybrid learning. So if we were able to do that, it means they were also capable of reimagining social impact as well, because it's it's very much linked. So in, in just dissecting the role of social impact at Stellenbosch University and actually at all South African universities for that matter, a couple of pointers. Principles. We do not exist for ourselves only. We do not practice our science and research in isolation or for only our own benefit. We do not serve only certain groups. We are a public university. We're a national asset and we're a public university in every sense of the word. And we have an impact on society and individual lives and livelihoods. And through our science and research, we have the capacity to change things for the better. And in this way, we can contribute to human flourishing and advance knowledge in service of society. And this was made very clear. It was made abundantly clear during COVID. So how do we actually do this? We do it in three ways. We do it firstly through corporate citizenship and the important points listed under that. Corporate citizenship, but it's by the employment of staff members it's providing economic opportunities for external service providers by sharing our facilities and resources at our institution, by being embedded in local and international networks and growing partnerships to do this. 
and then also by contributing to strengthening social cohesion, democracy, and transformation in our town, in our region, in the country, and the world. So Stellenbosch University is an example of a, of a university town, of a town gown, uh, a community where there's very much, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, a laboratory, a living laboratory of what we can achieve. So the second point, so the first one is corporate citizenship. The second one is engaged scholarship. And the important points here would be to do relevant research. This means research for impact patents, engaged teaching and learning with impact. And an example that we have here at Stellenbosch is our newly a relatively newly established Center for Epidemic Response and Innovation at our uh, Biomedical Research Institute on our Tiger Book campus. And it's a very good example of that. It's collaborative. It brings together world-class scientists to now create the largest genomic center in Africa. And it's an initiative that serves the people of the continent. The third one, so it's corporate citizenship, it's engaged scholarship, and it's engaged citizenship. So it's both students and staff that contribute through volunteerism and public service based on their individual skills and knowledge. So if we put this into how do we see the, the future of universities is that at Stellenbosch University, our vision is to be a leading research intensive university that aims to advance knowledge. And this is the key point to advance knowledge in service of society. Knowledge in service of society. And to how do we attempt to realize this vision? We're implementing amongst others, the following things. To accelerate hybrid learning, to unlock entrepreneurship and innovation, and to focus on academic renewal to continue meeting the requirements of the global economy. And lastly, also to escalate our hybrid model that we've now learned quite a bit about, to exploit new markets via additional learning pathways. So these, are, these four things are all part of the conversation about how universities could flourish in the future and thereby deepen social impact. So I think an interesting example is that of Arizona State University in the USA. Their president, Michael Crow, he's been president since 2002, has really transformed that institution. And he's a proponent of the concept of so-called national service universities. And in his most recent book entitled The Fifth Wave, The Evolution of American Higher Education, he defines national service universities as a new league of institutions, quote, unified in their resolve to accelerate positive social outcomes through the seamless integration of world-class knowledge production with cutting edge technological innovation and institutional cultures dedicated to the advancement of accessibility to the broadest possible demographic representative of the socioeconomic and intellectual diversity of our nation, close quote, diversity of the nation. And this actually links to a well-known quote by the recently deceased Mikhail Gorbachev, the last president of the Soviet Union. Peace is not unity in similarity, but unity in diversity. So South Africa is a diverse nation and we should use it to our advantage. So since 2015, Stellenbosch University has shifted its focus from community interaction to social impact, where social impact would be characterized by three things, broader partnerships and types of interactions, going beyond outcomes to focusing on impact, and thirdly, to provide a special development framework to increase relevance. And I think that's a great starting point from which to build and to reimagine social impact. And I really wish you all the best with the deliberations today. And let's reimagine together what social impact can truly be. So thank you very much.
And thank you, Professor Bimde Villiers. What a profound message, what a profound start, and a strong take home message that we get from that. In short, is that from a social, at least from a Salamash University's viewpoint, the take home message would be to advance knowledge in service of society and also very apt uh, reference to your knowledge partner in the US speaking about the seamless integration into society. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, now we move on to our second agenda item. Without any further ado, please let's welcome the Deputy um, Rector and Deputy Vice Chancellor to address us um, from in hails from the Social Impact and Transformation and Personnel Office. Professor Nico Kupman. Uh, thank you, Program Director. Good morning, colleagues around. Uh, good morning, Rector, and thank you so much. It was great listening to you. Good morning to all our colleagues and students from Stellenbosch University, and also a good morning to colleagues and students from other universities, and specifically a good morning to our community and societal partners who participate uh, today and uh, uh, warm uh, spring day. Good morning also to our panelists and our main speaker and all speakers who will participate. My colleague uh, Siobhan uh, Peters will share my brief presentation, uh, so I will immediately move to, to slide two uh, and speak to the to the presentation colleagues. Um, seven years ago, um, Professor Wim de Villiers was inaugurated as, as VC of Stellenbosch University. And in that address, he made this very important statement that as a rector, he is committed to the transformation of Stellenbosch University <laughs> and, and through Stellenbosch University. And we immediately started reimagining social impact as the transformation of the you know, of society that Stellenbosch University can contribute to in humble ways, but in resolute manner. So we speak about social impact as our praise transformation through the university. So when we talk a transformation at the university and through the university, transformation of the university and through the university, we say our impact that we want to make is a specific, there's a specific orientation for it. There's a specific direction, a specific purpose, a specific telos uh, that, we, that we are committed to. And if you read the transformation plan of 2017 of the university, we say the constitution of the Republic of South Africa clearly spells out the direction toward which South African individuals and trans also South African institutions are transforming toward. So we say South Africa wants to become a country where there is dignity for all, healing for all, justice for all, freedom for all, equality through equity for all. And if you walk on uh, some of our campuses, if you enter them, faculty of law amongst others, faculty of health and medicine, you will see the Bill of Rights visually represented there and these values, these principles on which we want to build this university and the country and the broader continent that we want to serve, you will see uh, this very visually displayed in works of art and visual redress. So in our transformation plan, we view transformation as a journey towards a university and local and global societies where these constitutional principles find concrete embodiment. Next slide. So when we talk social impact, it's for us consistently reciprocal impact and as the rector demonstrated, comprehensive impact. We do ask what impact do the plights of society make on us? 
only because we acknowledge that society and our societal partners impact upon us and because we take the concerns of society seriously, we can attempt to talk about social impact. Otherwise, the notion of impact is highly pretentious and inappropriate. This reciprocal impact of universities is on all spheres of society. We at the university earlier years spoke about community service, later about community interaction or in community engagement. And within the framework of the social impact paradigm, we built on especially the work that was done in community interaction, namely to say we should have a broader focus on political life, economic life, ecological life, and especially also on civil society with all its institutions, local communities, religious communities as part of civil society, educational institutions, sport, culture, art, NGOs, social movements, and a diversity of volunteers and activists amongst others. But then we pertinently add also to this list the sphere of public discourse and public opinion formation. We know that in our country where democracy is really at risk, we need to participate as universities also stronger in public discussions, in public opinion formation, which in the end impacts on public morality, public policy making, and public, broader public practices in our society. Next slide. One of the set of remarks that I want to make at the beginning of uh, this symposium on reimagining social impact is to illustrate that we try as university to make our impact in various interdependent modes. We do it, first of all, through the ongoing day-to-day -day research and innovation, learning and teaching of our academic environment. So that's why it's important. The distinctive contribution of a university to societal impact is the academic uh, uh, contribution. We are an academic institution and therefore we must say that from the academic environments we must be geared to make our impact. The other modes of course are interdependent these modes inform each other. So social impact is also embodied in the knowledge informed and knowledge informing volunteerism of our staff and especially our students. And here our MARTIs, still now community services and division of social impact play a crucial role at the university to build really engaged and responsible citizenship among students and also staff. Another mode, our rich diversity of professional academic support services like information technologies, physical facilities, financial services, human resources, campus health services, and entrepreneurship and commercialization are vehicles of social impact. <coughs> Pardon me. I refer to another mode, our arts, culture and sport entities <coughs> like Boerkfeest, the WOW project, the University Choir, University Museum, Marty Sport, our agents par excellence of transformative social impact. If you just give me a minute. <coughs> I hope the water will have a redeeming impact on me now. And social impact colleagues is advanced through the specific research based and learning centered initiatives of the faculties and academic departments. It is a joy if you look at our social impact knowledge platform and see the variety of programs and entities in literally all our faculties 
and most of our professional academic support environments that make a crucial contribution to reciprocal, comprehensive, and especially transformative social impact. The last two slides, colleagues, then I'll lend the aeroplane. <coughs> I stress the point again that these specific Im uh, social impact initiatives that I referred to in the previous slide drink from the ongoing academic work of the academic departments and they inform the academic work uh, of those departments. These initiatives are expressions and reminders of our social impact imperative and vocation as a university. And they inspire us to put on the lens of social impact in every article we write, every lecture we teach, every assessment we do, all learning that takes place in our professional academic support mandates and in our life together as university community. We consistently ask, how relevant is what I do for the betterment of society? What difference does my work make? In which direct and indirect ways does my work impact on society? Whilst acknowledging that no, not all impact is seen immediately, the dean of our faculty of natural sciences told me three years ago that some of the applications that we use nowadays in cell phones were developed by natural by natural scientists, specifically people in the field of physics, who did research on it at the end of the 19th century. And by then they couldn't imagine what impact would come after a century. Next page. One of our bigger challenges, colleagues, is how do we measure social impact, both qualitatively and quantitatively? How can we explore <coughs> narratives more, questionnaires, surveys more? How can we reach to numerical ways of, of measuring? And how can we advance recognition and incentivization? This is globally hard work. And I know people like panelist colleague Armand Bum are doing great work in this regard, and I really look forward to today and henceforth we can jointly as institutions locally and, and internationally uh, make progress on the challenge of measuring social impact. Next slide. I want to conclude with a quote that I like very much. I started with our rector and I conclude with a Rector the Daniel Gold Kilman, first president of Johns Hopkins University in 22, 22 February 1867 in his inaugural address. He reminded us what universities are about. And I think in our context where our challenges are amplified and intensified in the context of COVID and even now long COVID, lasting COVID, he reminded us that as a university, we exist for reasons like this. This is what he says universities are about. It is a reaching out for a better state of society than now exists. It's a dumb but indelible impression of the value of learning. It's a craving for intellectual and moral growth. It is a longing to interpret the laws of creation means a wish for less misery among the poor, less ignorance in schools, less bigotry in the temple, less suffering in the hospital, less fraud in business, less folly in politics. It means more study of nature, more love of art, more lessons from history, more security in property, more health in cities, more virtue in the country, more wisdom in legislation, more intelligence, more happiness, and more, I would add, healthy religion. Thank you, Program Director, uh, for the opportunity to make these few remarks, and thank you, colleagues, for your attention. Well, thank you, um, Professor Nick Kuipman, uh, the champion of the uh, 
Social Impact Transformation and Personnel Department at Salem Marsh University, and also a sterling pilot, if I may add, Professor Nico, um, albeit that we hit some turbulence along the way mid-air uh, with the frog in the throat, but you've negotiated uh, that very, very meticulously. Thank you for the safe landing. Nonetheless, I've taken four points, especially, especially from your address, which is um, truly profound in the sense where you refer to the rule of reciprocity. Um, um, where the university as a place of high learning learns from civil society and also civil society in turn can learn from places of higher learning. Secondly then, and, and, and I want to just recap this because this uh, draws us to, to perhaps probing this further on later when we open the floor to the wider audience. The second point where you highlights the, uh, the, the, the stimulation of public discussions uh, in all its disciplines. Uh, that discourse is imperative. Also, you say remain focused, stay true to your task at hand. Um, uh, we, as a place of higher learning, university contributes academically to so the academic contribution to society. And the fourth one, where you need to question your perceived value add, question your what you have done at the end of the day, and try and establish the impact thereof in society. Professor Nico, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Gerard. We now move on to, uh, well, having gone from the champion of this discipline to the jockey of this discipline, and need I say, when I saw her this morning, she was up and about like an ever-ready battery, a rearing to go. So without any further ado, to set the scene for us is the Director of Social Impact, Ms. Ernestine Mayer-Adams. Thank you, Gerard. Good morning, colleagues. Good morning to our Rector. Deputy Vice Rector, our keynote speaker, distinguished guests, stakeholders, and partners of social impact, colleagues, friends, as well as our students. It is my firm belief that we have the responsibility to not just reimagine, but to reevaluate our way of being by looking afresh at how we do social impact. The current demands of higher education on higher education institutions expect us to do research, teaching and learning, and engage with the communities we serve in a transformative manner, different from what we had done in the past. During the passing months, we have been reimagining, rethinking, and refocusing, which I would like to refer to as grappling with redefining the meaning of transformative social impact. Our aim with the symposium is to listen to and engage with our colleagues about their journey on the same road towards transformative social impact and learn what worked, what are the pitfalls, what is deemed as imperatives, what are the red flags, and what has become best practices. Our approach is collaborative sense making because we are acutely aware of the fact that our future depends on our contribution to the transformation agenda of our country. How we transform teaching and learning, research and engaging with the communities we serve is through engaged teaching and learning, through engaged research, and through engaged citizenship. I believe our future efforts should encompass an inherent component to influence national policy guidelines on higher education actively. Because this is the way how we will ensure meaningful transformation, transformative change well into the future. Challenges that still look and stare at us right in the face in 2022 are, for example, grade 12 learners across the country that still cannot read properly teachers that must contend with impossibly full classes, to name but a few. This compromises the future of an entire generation, and I believe we in the higher education sector can play a meaningful role to stem the tide. Our research outputs should address these matters head on in a transformative manner, seeking meaningful solutions. I'm very excited about our task at hand, and we are looking forward to engaging discussions today 
toward gaining deeper insight into the role Stellenbosch University can play as an active player in the bigger higher education arena. The time for courageous conversations is now. And I was reminded that not so long ago, our rector had been part of a group of academics that deliberated on the very essence of what a university in the future should look like. Thank you once again to everyone that took the time out to join us today for this and I trust transformative and exciting engagement. I thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ernestine. That's Ernestine Maya Adams. She's the director for social impact at Stellenbosch University. Perhaps just a take home and what Ernestine had shared with us is that the real focus is on doing things differently henceforth. Uh, also, the transformation social impact agenda that needs to be driven and also a real strong focus on best practices. Thank you very much. Well, that sets the table in moving forward. Um, suffice it to say that I'm sure you'd agree with me that our world as we know it, colleagues, or may not yet know, to, to some extent is growing incredibly fast. But by the same token, with this meteoric growth, uh, comes a long list of responsibilities and challenges. And um, to many uh, people in the world and all that's happening currently locally and abroad. And to some of those people, nine times out of 10, that big world, big, big world out there is as immediate as the immediate surrounds. That's all they know. And yet it is a difficult task. Without any further ado, our keynote speaker, is based at the School of Governance, University of Advertisement in Johannesburg. He is founder and chairperson of the Democracy Works Foundation. He is also chairperson of Action Aid. He was former advisor to the UNESCO World Social Sciences Report in 2016, entitled Challenging Inequalities, Pathways to a Just World in Paris. He was also advisor developing as an impact invest investment sector and markets in Africa, United Nations Development Program. He was former lead analyst, Development Bank of Southern Africa. He has also advised governments on establishing several state agencies, including the Parliamentary Budget Office and Treasury's Infrastructure Project Preparation Fund. And he was also co-founder and co-principal author of the 2012 South African Development Report. Our keynote speaker was independent advisor on the KPMG's new governance strategy following a series of corruption scandals, established the KPMG Public Interest Fund, and was chairman of the fund in which the equivalent of the alleged corrupt money was deposit deposited and distributed to civil society. I see a grin on his face there, meaning something. I hope that you will elaborate later on. Also in community organizations and social enterprises, he's been involved in. He's also principal author, Economic Empowerment Strategy, Japan Oil, Gas and Metals National Corporation in Kawasaki, Japan. Our keynote speaker chaired the boards of audit committees of a number of public organizations, including being the chairman, audit committee, commission, for conciliation, mediation, and arbitration, as we know with the CCMA. Also Deputy Chairman, Audit Committee, Legal Aid South Africa, and Chairman at the Charlotte Mateke Academic Hospital. Our keynote speaker founded and sold a number of private companies, including the Little Blue Black Book, sold successfully to Times Media Limited, was the founder also of Broad Daylight Forms Production Company. Previously, our keynote speaker was senior associate member and Oppenheimer Fellow at St. Anthony's College, Oxford University. Also program director, Africa Asia Centre, School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. He's also course leader, Public School of Public Policy, Central European University in Budapest. And he's senior research fellow, at London School of Economics and Political Sciences. He's also a press fellow, Wolfson College, Cambridge University, course leader there, also at New School University in New York, and a visiting fellow 
Duke University in North Carolina. Our keynote speaker is the author of a couple of number one bestsellers, his most recent book being, wait for it, Restless Nation, Making Sense of Troubled Times. Delegates here to deliver our much anticipated keynote address, speaking on reimagining social impact, I present to you the acclaimed scholar, Professor William Gumede. Thank you very much for um, inviting me. Um, I'm very grateful um, to be part um, of your event. Um, I wish so much that I was live and I could interact with you. I've been missing um, just interacting with people and I'm sure you also, all of you, um, um, after COVID-19, uh, have missed the interaction with others. Um, but I'm absolutely grateful to 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 co-think with you um, on social social impact and something which is very close um, to my heart. And um, what I'm going to do, and I um, I taught, I'll talk through you know my lessons uh, and my engagement um, with uh, organisations um, in improving um, social pack and, and some of the challenges. Um, in the context of, of our society. Uh, I'm going to say, although I have, I mean, I have a, a number of slides, but I am going to say, I'll put up only one slide and you'll see uh, after which why um, I um, will only um, say one slide and, and I will um, Talk through that slide, so I'm just going to. Um, yeah, let me just put it up. And uh, and before I start, it's also just to say that, um, you know, many of the things I will be talking through. Um, there we go. It's coming up. You know, um, I will pass on some of the documents, some of the papers. Um, you, you know, to the units um, uh, of, uh, and so on for people um, who are interested um, in, in, in further. Let me just, I'm, I'm going to get you to um, the slide which I want to put on. S slide 11. There we go. All right, okay. I mean, for me, the big question, of course, um, what is the role of universities, but what is also the role of, of organizations, institutions, public institutions, uh, private companies um, in the context of state failure? Um, if, the, if the state fails, what is the university's role? And then what should be social impact objectives be amidst, amidst state failure, but also amidst multiple societal failures? Because, you know, as a country where we are now in multiple failures, failures of morals, ethics, a failure of democracy, mm -hmm. uh, corporate greed, mm -hmm. um, failure, of, yes. failure of leadership. Um, could I just ask the colleagues who attend just to mute? We have, you know, rising tribalism and tribalism, you know, in a, in a broad spectrum. I mean, we're the world's most diverse society, but sadly, at this moment in the country, there are many people who think that that diversity is actually a bad thing um, and not a good thing. And that many people, and because the state fails and because of the high levels of corruption, many um, ordinary citizens have withdrawn. Um, into their own little lagers, into families, uh, you know, into the people, you know, into their own communities where the people uh, who um, speak their language or look um, um, their color uh, uh, and so on. But we also have at the moment in the country a failure of relevant ideas um, for our crisis context. Um, so one has to look at social impact 
of the university in that context. Um, relevant ideas in the context of we with a broken society, with broken individuals, um, so the, you know, traumatized colonialism, apartheid has trauma has, has left us a, a general intergenerational legacy of traumatized in, individuals. Uh, many with inferiority complexes, but we also have um, superiority uh, uh, complexes at the same time. And then, of course, you know, the inequalities and the skewed uh, uh, wealth. And then also Stellenbosch University specifically, uh, you know, the university's past legacy, its past debt uh, because of its attachment uh, um, with the old uh, apartheid regime. Um, and then can the university lead and, and 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 not only lead um, but be um socially impactful in or in, in these um, um uh, uh, contexts and now a, a a core component of leading in that context um will be for you you know the university to secure the legit um legitimacy through social license and i'm going to come um, and back to socialized licensing and true democratic city, uh, um, university citizenship. And a lot of people talk uh, about corporate citizenship. Now, I want to put the emphasis not on corporate citizenship, but on democratic uh, corporate citizenship. Um, there's a, a, a different nuance, a democratic corporate citizenship focus on a different kind of impact uh, versus a cop. Uh, um, corporate um, um, citizenship. I see just on the, I, I, I'm able to see on the sort of meeting chat. Um, can anyone hear me clearly? Perhaps maybe just, just before I go on, can anybody hear me clearly and can anyone? Um, yeah, yes. Okay. We hear you. Uh, yeah, go ahead. We hear you. Bro. Thank you. I, um, Now I'll start off and, and um, to say that the models, the South, South African, the dominant corporate social responsibility model um, of corporates in the country, and not only corporates, when I say corporates, um, it would be institutions, public institutions, and also um, universities. I will argue um, that it is inadequate um, that it is irrelevant and it lacks credibility. So, you know, the model that we use for CSR, um, the model that we use for social impact, the dominant models are irrelevant to our developing country context. And it means that often uh, social impact in those contexts are often then inadequate, um, not wide, ranging and not meaningful and not sustainable. And the results of a dispersed social impact based on flawed uh, uh, models is that we get we get stakeholders that are resentful or angry and often say that initiatives, transformative initiatives are window dressing, um, so very little buy in. Now, in those contexts, what it means is that if, if it's the wrong model, what we get is that institutions' social license to operate, and the social license um, to operate is the approval that society gives an organization and an institution, a whether it's a company or, or a university, uh, to operate. So that's my opening gambit. Now, there's one really big obstacle to social impact um, in many of our institutions. It is the corporate model or organization model of many of our institutions, including our universities. And I'm going to talk much more broadly than just universities, because I think it's it's very useful to you know to have the conversation as as broadly as possible, and I'll I'll come at the end specifically um, um to look at university uh, um, uh, in its specificity. 
Now, countries have dominant organizational um, models uh, or corporate uh, models, and, and, and those dominant corporate models influence the social impact uh, or the de delivery of, 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 of social impact um, of, an, uh, of an organization. Now, South Africa has, since the apartheid era, a dominant, what I would call an apartheid era corporate or organizational model, which many companies, especially the companies that, that comes predate uh, the, the, the dem democratic period, um, have. And that model, and it's the, the model in the, in the way corporates organize themselves in, you know, internally and the way they engage with society um, and the way they engage with the world and the way they engage um, with themselves. And that model comes from the South African mining industry, um, from the farms and from the churches, because the, you know, these three were the first big um, institutions, um, public institutions um, um, uh, in the country. And, and, and the models that comes um, in our, our corporate model, our organizational models, um, really comes um, out of these um, dominant um, early, early models. Now, there's about six or seven pillars of that model. And the one is very obvious model. You know, you can get it in any model in any other country um, outside South Africa. Is a sort of management culture of top being top down and hierarchy. The second one, which is very particularly of particular, of course, to South Africa, is a racially divided workplace. The third one is. And this is now really outside of university, but often the criticism in recent times is that many of universities are now also following this model, the one on profit making, um, which is based on sort of the model of profit making, making is based on low wages, minimal skills transfer, uh, and minimal rights for employees. And then and again, just for the audience, I'm using a broad con con uh, um, definition of of corporate institutions that goes beyond the university, but also that includes the university. Now, part of our, our, our the, the South African corporate model is one also that is where profit yields are often higher than our international peers. If you look, for example, at our banks and our mining companies, I mean, the pressure um, incentives in, in, in many of these companies are very much on generating uh, profits, which if we compare it, you, you know, to their peers in other countries, whether it's in industrial countries or developing countries, it's it's you know focusing on much much higher um, hills um, than international peers, and lastly, our model, our corporate model, is less stakeholder capitalism. So when I say stakeholder, in the terms of we've got a very narrow capitalistic model, um, um, which focus very much only on stakeholders, the organization as the stakeholder, and we less on all of the wider stakeholders, including in our communities, um, our employees as stakeholders, our environment as stakeholders, um, and, and, and so on. Now, that corporate model really can either retard or it can facilitate social impact.
The second overall argument I want to make is that all institutions need a social license to operate. So if an institution doesn't have that social license to operate, it is very difficult for that institution to make the envisaged um, social impact. Now, let me unpack what I think is a social license to operate, is that in the South African context, Certain kinds of institutions um, and corporates have a higher social license to operate requirement. Talking about our mining companies, because you, you, you know um, many people do believe that mining is a public resource, um, so companies are expected um, to do more and it increases uh, the social license. But companies and institutions that operated during the apartheid era and that has been seen as part of the old apartheid, the apartheid era complexes are also often, also often needs a higher social license to operate because there are higher expect expectations um, from particularly victims um, of a past disadvantaged communities for them to do more um, in the new democratic dispensation. So higher expectations is going to be higher criticism uh, of them in the things they do. Um, yeah, um, you know, almost like the vergroot class, the vergroot class uh, on them. Um, is going to be um, much more detail in 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 what they do. And many of these institutions, of course, many in our communities perceive the old era institutions that were seen as part of the apartheid complex um, as illegitimate. Um, um, at, uh, and so on. And Stellenbosch University is one of those institutions where people that you, you know that requires a higher social license um, to operate because of its past. And it and that will impact um, on its delivery um, of its um, social impact um, objectives. The second, the, well, or the, uh, the, the third factor um, in the social impact and the quality of social impact, it, it is democratic corporate citizenship. Now, normally people would talk about corporate citizenship, so now I want to bring in democratic corporate citizenship rather than just corporate citizenship. And democratic corporate citizenship is a much more expansive um, definition of a role of a corporate, the role of an institution, particularly, particularly in a developing um, democracy, um, with all of the issues of a developing democracy. So, democra democratic corporate citizenship then is. How a, how a public institution behave as a democratic citizen, um, not necessarily only as a corporate citizen, but as a democratic citizen, which have higher demands to operate than just being uh, an ordinary a corporate um, um, citizen. And democratic corporate citizenship, again, um, it's even more crucial aspect um, of social impact in countries that comes from our legacies, from totalitarian legacies, from apartheid, um, from segregationist legacies, um, the demands on 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 public inst on institutions and on corporates um, to behave. 
um, democracy creates a higher demand um, than, let's say, in other countries. Now, let me unpack maybe three or four elements of a democracy um, city, uh, corporate citizen. One is the sort of very obvious, is how a company engages with its external environment. And the second one is how it engages with its internal um, environment, its, its, its internal culture. Then how it engaged related to the first, um, to its stakeholders and to society. And then the additional element is how it engages with his past, with the legacy of the past, its own legacy um, in the past. And then, of, of course, is how does it engage with the future that it, that it wants to create, that it envisages, and society envisages. Now, the better with the, or the higher the quality of democratic corporate citizenship, the higher the social license to operate, the so more approval from society uh, for public institution um, 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 to operate. I'm taking you to the fourth aspect. of social impact. And really, I want to make an argument that an institution in a developing country needs a different model uh, for social impact. And I want to argue that the dominant social impact model in South Africa is one really more appropriate for a developed country and not for a developing country. And many of our, our models focus really on what I must say is really providing good pub, uh, public relations, certain aspects of sports, narrow as aspects of ESG, the environment, so, um, sustainability and governance, black economic empowerment, which is really focused on individuals rather than a really broad base. And I want to argue that in a developing country, and particularly in a developing country with our legacy, um, that social impact models must include social justice, democracy building, and these two are largely absent in 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 our, in, in our current models. And the last one I, I want to make an argument for, and it is not something that which is discuss uh, or even and often thought about is the idea of an institution engaging in corporate or institutional welfare. One often thinks about um, a welfare state, but I want to make an argument for Institutional welfare, corporate welfare, is an important aspect of social impact. And that is the difference between social impact in a developing country and social impact in an industrial country. And I tell you, I mean, I have done or looked or audited social impact for organizations around the world. Um, both industrial countries and countries as diverse, um, you know, from Japan to Uruguay um, uh, and so on. 
and I've come to the conclusion that the social impact in a developing country and the models of social impact, um, there has to be an aspect of, I mean, for the lack of a better term, organizational welfare or institutional welfare or corporate uh, welfare. I'm going to unpack that um, um, a little further. Now, there's a link between democratic corporate citizenship, the social license to operate, and social impact. To summarize, poor democratic corporate citizenship, or weak ones, the ministers of uh, institutions social license to operate, increases the expectation from society um, on that institution to operate. Now, if the institution is implicated in corruption scandals, ethical breaches, um, transformational inconsistencies, or any behavior that's inconsistent where the institutions declared values, it then undermines that social license to operate. I mean, obviously this argument can be made, can be also made at a government level. If a government behaves inconsistent to the constitutional values, the government government's license to operate um, to engage with its citizens' credibility, its authority, and so on, is obviously also undermined. Then, the past. Um, lack of engagement with the past and lack of transformative engagement. It's not, I'm not making an argument for staying in the past because we should not stay in the past. Um, even whether it is an institution, whether it is an, well, as a, at an individual level, um, we have to be in the present and build for the future. Um, so the past is we should not be imprisoned by the past, but it is really important to engage imaginatively with the past, to bring the past, you know, so it has to be creatively um, rather than being stuck um, in the past. And a crucial part of that engagement is social justice. And I want to bring in reparations for the past. So institutional reparations for the past. So if there is not an appropriate engagement with the past, it also undermines the social license um, to operate and it undermines the social impact um, of an organization. Now, the university. Uh, the traditional role of the university, obviously, very traditional, very mainstream role of the university is to manage the complex challenges of, a, of changing societies, technology to manage the world. Traditional, very, very um, straightforward um, role of the university. And second element of this, really tr the traditional um, role of the university is to, to lay the basis, obviously, for sustainable employment, for citizenship, democratic citizen, for personal development, and for the advancement of the knowledge, a country's knowledge base, individuals' knowledge base, communities knowledge base. But I want to add a couple of a couple of other things which is more contextual to our society. It is also to foster democratic citizenship. So it's students, it's staff, it's employees, 
the stakeholders, the university's role is to foster part of its social impact, democratic citizenship. Now, our past and our cultures where we come from are not democratic. So, South Africans, we have to learn how to become democrats. And we, and we have to set our undemocratic skins of the pre-democratic era uh, or of our cultures, um, our communities, uh, and so on. So the role of the university from a social impact point of view in this context is to foster that democratic citizenship, the learning of that democratic citizenship. And in, in that learning or relearning or new learning of that democratic citizenship means immediately a chance of received wisdom. I say receive wisdom, it's a challenge. The students come or staff, it's a challenge in the individual context of what they learned in their families, what they learned in the communities, what they learned in the in the in the cultures, the challenge or in the traditions or in the customs. And that's that demo, democratic citizenship, the unlearning of received wisdom in families, received wisdom in communities, in cultures, in religious contexts, to foster a democratic citizenship which is aligned to our constitution. And that as a social impact, it's a very powerful, potentially powerful um, social impact role um, of the university. Then in the context of where we are as a society, high levels of corruption, breakdowns in morality, when I say breakdown in morality, I'm talking in the context of democratic morality, that we've got such a deep crisis in the country where, or rather that corruption is because of a morality crisis that's so deep. It's a morality crisis that spans all of the moral governing systems of the country. So, you know, a country would have different systems, the moral systems that govern the behavior of people. You know, you could, your family values could govern the way you behave morally. Your cultural values, your customs, traditions could govern that. If you're a professor, you go to university, you become a medical doctor or auditor, then the ethics of your profession will govern the way, the way you, you behave. To you go to church or any other religion, uh, that will govern you. Or sometimes in political parties, um, the cultures of political parties govern people's behavior. Now, what we've got, and the reason why we have high levels of corruption in the country, is that all of those systems, those governing systems, have all broken down, all been corroded. I and mean, what is the role then of the university in that context? To rebuild over a much more wider front um, morality as an institution. And that context also from a social compact point of view, because it's a country right now, we are facing, we are, we are having a leadership crisis that also across all of these different dimensions, so cultural, um, political, religious, business, high levels of business corruption also. So leaders of crisis across all of those spheres. So from a social impact point of view, it is going to be crucial for universities to model the leadership for society, 
because we've run out of models at this moment in a country uh, because of the failures of leadership across so many spheres. Um, so universities will have to model it. So university leadership, the responsibility on university leadership to model leadership for society, not just for the university community, but for society. And this, of course, all of this, doing all of this, well, actually, still playing the traditional role of the university. Um, solving the short term problems in our society, but also having the long term view. The universities must have a long term view. Um, and also still dealing with uh, concerns that define us as human beings, the things we struggle um, as human beings. And then all of that, of course, while balancing all of this with the ideal of universities, of pursuing knowledge for its own sake, knowledge for the sake of its own sake. Yeah. I'm going to come to an end, so just to this degree, in, in enough time um, um, for questions. Um, the model, what would be a social impact model, be then some of the elements um, of it? Democratic corporate citizenship. Empower within the university or within a company and outside. So the empowerment from within and empowerment from outside and empowerment of those who lost out in the past, which includes reparations for the past, uh, will be a big part of it. The modeling of democratic citizenship behavior within and without. The obligations to govern honestly in the university context. Um, treating employees, stakeholders, contractors with due care, compassion, and fairly. Transparent, engage with society, with stakeholders in a transparent way. But maybe one thing which I did not talk about is what state failure for the university is actually to build social compacts at their level with their communities, with businesses, where they operate. And then lastly, the idea of institutional welfare for its employees, for its community, um, and for those who've been left out um, in the past. And maybe at the end, and I conclude a little bit more provocatively, potentially for the university almost to operate like a government, an alternative government. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor William Gumedi. Um, while we give you an opportunity to grab a glass of water, I'm sure your throat is catching up on you, at least the drivers there are. Um, and we're also giving our uh, colleague, Siobhan, an opportunity to package the questions or comments that's going to come through, which you will uh, read to us. Uh, we thank you for that insightful presentation and um, where you have cast your net wide and uh, to use the ophthalmic expression to have a glaucomic approach and bring it to narrow it down to um, our immediate surrounds, particularly from the university's viewpoint and societies. Um, allow me just to recap a couple of key points that, that I grabbed from your uh, presentation, and I'm sure this will also spark some, um, I hope, rigorous and robust interaction with you. Um, you. Um, you, you, you started out by uh, questioning the role of universities regarding social impact in the event of state failure, and that was quite profound. Um, and the failure of relevant ideas, I think that's what you've mentioned. You also referred to the term diversity being questioned. Very, very interesting. 
and and and, and who do that you know, who does question diversity and the relevance thereof. Also, then given Salamos universities connect with uh, um, with the past past regime, um, you know, um, you 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 uh, yeah, sort of so the, the social interventions. Uh, you question how really impactful can it be. Um, also very interesting, and I'm hoping to hear from uh, the powers that be to talk to that. Um, then also the inadequate or irrelevant, uh, the, 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 with reference to the social impact models uh, and the CSI models, in fact, you refer to the inadequate or irrelevant to the developing countries context. I take it from a South African viewpoint, perhaps, or Southern African viewpoint, and we can spread that even further and look at SADC and even um, Sub-Saharan Africa also, where a lot of him happening, particularly now with uh, uh, looming elections, and also one that has really, really um, uh, caused, um, uh, not concern, but uh, if you look at what happened in Kenya of late, um, one can um, refer to perhaps the models that they have, what worked for them and what will work for the rest of Africa. And South Africa shouldn't be seen perhaps as the America of Africa. But then again, I'm throwing that uh, clip in the boss, if you will. Um, uh, what you also mentioned of the obstacle, the models of yesteryear. Uh, uh, you refer to the farms and the churches of being the first public institutions. That's very interesting. Um, one can ask, but to what extent do they still play a significant role, farms and churches, agriculture, is 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 a very big economic driver, particularly in the Western Cape, being the biggest employer as such. What is their their role within the South African context, and particularly within the social uh, impact dynamics, and of course the church, um, not forgetting the church uh, and their role. You are unpacking the corporate model and its impact on social impact. Um, I struggle to see how the positives. Uh, overwhelm the negatives, in fact, not me, but you, uh, if I read you correctly. Um, the case um, uh, um, of um, just being more in charge. So it's, it's more things changed, the more they stay the same. That is more or less the message I got from you. And then it refers to the expectations that's on the rise, expectations on the rise within civil society versus uh, it's more an indirect proportional phenomenon, indirect proportional to delivery on those expectations as they arise. And then you also distinguished between corporate citizenship versus democratic corporate, corporate citizenship. Uh, one can ask what is the uh, fundamental difference, there, even though you unpacked the, the whole phenomenon of corporate citizenship. And very interesting, uh, Professor Gomeli, you talked about the um, corporate. I must get this right, the corporate social welfare or the social corporate welfare. Perhaps just to distinguish between the two, corporate social welfare versus the uh, corporate social welfare. And uh, you also said very strong not to stay in the past, but to engage in the future and uh, to engage in the present and to focus on the future. Um, you also then immediately said that one needs to have appropriate engagement with regard to the past. It's not that you are sort of reiterating and going back on what you stated, but we need to engage appropriately with regard to the future, but also the present and then foc while focusing on the future. What I did find very sad and materialistic, as you'd say, or deplorable is um, the suggestion or the fact that you stated that South Africa still have to learn how to become democratic. Um, almost 30 years down the road, I get the impression what you've not said and what I could read between the lines is that we are in a scenario where it's like the proverbial dog that had caught the bus and um, do not know what to do with it. We have not been sensitized as to how to deal with our newfound freedom in 1994 and how to unpack that and go about in a responsible citizenry way. So very interesting to, to tap into that. So uh, that in a nutshell, uh, the Professor William Gomedi, um, I want to thank you for that very thought provoking presentation. Um, and at that point, at this point, I'd love to hear from Siobhan 
whether we have any questions or uh, and or uh, contributions uh, uh, to uh, directed at our keynote speaker, Siobhan. Uh, thank you, uh, program director. Um, there is a question um, from the audience. Um, the question in particular comes from Renee, and the question is, what in your opinion is the role of university, especially SU, in addressing the morality or ethical crisis in South Africa? Um, there's a ton of um, appreciation for your address, uh, Prof Kamele, so thank you very much. It is indeed thought provoking. Um, that was the one question that I picked up in the chat. There were some comments that we need to think in another way about the values and voices of the past. Um, we need to simultaneously, um, Diana from Rhodes University, welcome, has said, indicated that simultaneously disruptive and inspiring, a very helpful presentation. Um, Dr. Slamat, the contributions made thus far at the symposium on the reimagining social impact also opens the door to the question of reimagining the university. Um, Sylvia has commented, we've run out of models, indeed inspiring. Um, another colleague, um, Jana Muller, such a refreshing, honest and challenging keynote. Um, Prof Kumede, thank you. The reality of our social license to operate is a new concept for me, and yet it is so crucial in how we view our work and the impact thereof. Um, Dr. Cleofas um, has mentioned here, yeah, the existential threat that the 21st century university faces is one of neoliberal capitalism um, takeover. Should universities not be teaching resistance, reimagining alternatives to the neoliberal university um, paradigm? as an entrepreneurial university. In other words, students and staff must return to reading Fanon, Biko, Neville, Alexander, etc. to make sense of what went wrong in the 1990s. Look beyond the myth of rainbowism. And Dr. Saruchera. All right, may I please, sorry, Siobhan. If is the last one, leave yeah. It there for, please leave sure. it there for a while, and as the others also come in, and give uh, Dr. Gumedi an opportunity to respond not only from the ones that came from the platform, but also then from the um, others that were highlighted in summary. Professor Gumedi. Sure. Um, I'm going to start um, with, uh, thank you for the questions um, and, and, and the comments and the engagement. And I'll start with the ethic, you know, with the ethics of it, because that really is, um, I think is something that worry many many South Africans of the ethical collapse um, in our country. I mean, there are two levels that the university can play a role. You know, first obviously is to to model what is good ethical behaviour. So, university if the university leaders can model that and model it, you know, across the university structures. So, at every leadership level, model um, leadership. The second is, you know, to begin to think of teaching ethics um, at every level, so compulsory for every course. Um, if you arrive at university, um, and even if you are a lecturer or professor, um, to teach ethics. I mean, I have been um, in the long past. I didn't think one could teach ethics, but I have since changed my mind. I mean, the last decades I've been teaching a program and, and I was initially very reluctant to teach a program for members of parliament of the of the British Commonwealth. So British Commonwealth, any you know, countries from India to Jamaica to Australia to Canada. Um, and when I was asked um, long back to, to take it on, I was very skeptical that ethics could be taught. I initially told, well, actually, you get it um, in your family, you get it in your community, you get it in your religious organizations, in your professions, um, and so on. I've now come, I've changed, and I think in a society where we, where the society is broken, where um, the notion of family is also broken, it then becomes quite important for the university and from that social impact point of view, to almost to not only model but to teach 
how does one behave? Um, how do you behave in intimate spaces? How do you behave with others? Um, how do you behave um, in public? Um, how do you behave um, in your work? Because it's very unlikely um, that many students or many citizens would have gotten that whether at home or from religions or their political parties and so on. So that becomes an, an important thing. It's almost like a compu compulsory model of ethics for every student and every staff member who um, arrives at university. So that's for me, um, you know, two ways of, of dealing with that. The second one in terms of um, what has also been exciting me or exercise me the last couple of years is resilience. How can we make citizens resilient? And communities really resilient, and of course, countries really resilient. Countries were always, we, you know, crises, or, or, or obviously we want life to be without crises, yeah, countries to be without crises. But countries will and individuals and families will bump into a crisis. And how do we how do we teach resilience? And or how do we engage with communities and individuals and our stakeholders to make you know the idea of resilience, of getting up, um, of imagining, of thinking outside. Uh, one's limitations. So that's going to be, I think that's really going to be important. I don't know how we say how to do it, but it's going to be important. Um, I believe very much in entrepreneurial societies. I think it's important. I think the reason why some societies, developing countries since the Second World War have failed and others have done better is that those who have focused on entrepreneurship Inclusive entrepreneurship, but entrepreneurship have done better, and those who haven't has done poorer. So, can universities also be entrepreneurial? You know, as part of a new model. Um, obviously, if similar, you know, can a country be entrepreneurial? Can the state be um, more entrepreneurial? Um, so, and I think link to the idea of resilience, um, so re resilience to bounce back, to navigate problems, to embrace, to see opportunities um, in problems. So can the university teach that? And can the university itself as an organization see problems as opportunities? Uh, yeah, and that would be an organi organization or culture change um, um to do that and the last one was the issue in terms of dealing with how a crisis is our intellectual i mean the intellectual role of the university i mean you know i a couple of years ago with a, a couple of, of, of scholars um came up with a book called the poverty of ideas um the retreat of intellectuals i would argue that the university universities have retreated in south africa from engaging with society, from le leading the debates, from leading intellectual debates. And for me, importantly, in a developing country like South Africa, I mean, we're also facing, we mustn't forget, a global crisis of ideas. And it is going to be absolutely crucial for universities and that role of the universities to imagine new ideas and new ways of, of doing to deal with our problems. And, uh, you know, and not to go back to the past with past solutions for current problems. And, and I think it's going to be a very important from a resilience point of view for society and for individuals. Um, there's a university's role in modeling and teaching new ideas for our problems, because many of our problems locally and also globally in the region cannot be tackled with the old ideas, with the ideas of the past. And it's going to be very, very crucial from intellectually, the social impact intellectually, um, that we build the kind of scholars 
just reimagine ideas, new ideas to grapple with, with, with our complex uh, problems. So you for ourselves to imagine ourselves outside the old ideas, you know, to set our skins, our intellectual skins of, of our received ideas in order to get come up with new ideas. Of course, these things are not easy, it's frightening because if you have to get rid of the ideas that you grow up with, um, that you socialize with and politicize with and in the churches with, and now you have to think outside those ideas, it's frightening. Um, it's it's not easy, but in that frightening and that vulnerability, intellectual vulnerability lies all the possibilities. But just maybe on that point before we go back to the floor, and uh, you've just touched on that, and I want to take it a bit further. Um, the issue of conflict. Um, you were asked recently in an Al Jazeera interview on your opinion on mm -hmm. President Solomon Abbas's ability to turn the ship whether he in fact can get himself out of this pickle and you were adamant that he can't. There's no way that he can if in, if in fact there's going to be one big upheaval for him as such. Well, South Africa, in terms of the impact it had on its citizenry, um, has got al allies the world over. But the problem is in the UK, we see what's happening there. Within a week or now, we, they'll have a new head of state. Um, we know what's happening, the ups and downs with mar a gate and... <laughs> Uh, President Biden has his hands full. He's got no time to think about um, the cousins across the Atlantic. Um, Europe is, is to, to, to some extent, also in disarray, whether um, NATO is going to incorporate the ravaged Ukraine, etc. And then, of course, uh, as alluded to conflict, that being a money spinner or at least a big economic driver in terms of that. We have war in Russia. Some argue that Russia is really coining it with regard to this, their uh, resources. Um, and that the world needs them. So there's a, perhaps an argument to be made. And then down south uh, in Australia, where, you know, also having their, um, being an ally of us, but also having their own problems with their head of state. We're not sure who is who down there currently. The question now is, um, with the cost of living crisis, because that is primarily where we feel it on our skin, do we need to, 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 to worry about all those things that are way far away from us as the perceived in terms of distances or have a very myopic view and say, I only need to deal with what is in my immediate surrounds. Um, do universities, as you say, I mean, they've got this responsibility uh, to, to engage with their communities um, uh, and, and, and try to be that beacon of hope and try to interpret what's happening far away and bring it down and make it more palatable to our immediate communities. I think it's important to have the balance of local and then outside. Um, even in my own, and, and maybe the way to explain to you, you know, I'm very engaged myself, obviously with local, very local issues. But I'm also very engaged with very issues very far off. I mean, I teach in Eastern Europe at in Budapest, the Central European University now um, in Vienna. And over the last 30, 40 years, although I've been here locally, I've engaged, tried to engage in other contexts. And when I say in other contexts, it's quite deep in the other contexts, uh, you, you know, um, in the Middle East. Um, for over a decade for the New School University, where I led um, for over a decade the New School University in New York's um, um, program on political culture um, in, in sort of very difficult um, societies. So I think our universities and our intellectuals must think local, but also to balance of international um, and, and and to try to find that balance, um, and it's 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 a, it's a very important balance. So we can't become too narrow, um, too local focused, as if the world outside um, doesn't matter. Because the whole the, the exciting thing about local and global is the learning that well, one learns, one learns, and others learn from one. Um, you know the co-learning. And it's a germination of new ideas and, and it's, it's inspire one's imagination to come up 
um, with new ideas. Um, and it also provides, a, a, um, um, you know, the energy um, that one obviously often needs. I mean, the other important thing is, which maybe I didn't emphasize early on on this on the social impact, is the university. Universities could create the inclusive communities because you know at the end of the day, a university is almost like a is a community, a society within itself, and modeling how an inclusive society can operate. You know, all racial, um, all colors, all languages, all religions, and cooperating together, learning to live together, um, learning about each other. Um, at a, at a time where in the country, sadly, many people do not see the beautifulness of our diversity, um, you, you know, the exciting growth possibilities of di what diversity brings, the exciting entrepreneurial opportunities that diversity brings, and just, um, you know, how diversity can help with the imagination of everything if we can um, embracing it, you know, uh, uh, and so on. So across society, there is an argument um, um, which is a, um, it's a terrible argument that, you, you know, once one part of a community has is to blame for something, you, you know, for all of the country's problems, or if one part of the community takes control of a state or society, everything is going to be um, 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 perfect uh, and so on, rather than um, um, us as a society using all of our diversity, because that's a, is, is, is actually South Africa's competitive advantage. And, and, and it's going to be crucial for the university to find, to explore how to use the diversity for the university's competitive advantage and entrepreneurial um, 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 advantage. And the last one in terms of which is a little bit more, you know, the sort of thing that I worry about and I engage with is apartheid has let traumatize a traumatized society. And to say the traumatized society is both, you know, blacks traumatized, but whites are also traumatized. And how do we have that conversation in a safe way, in a in an imagine, imaginative way, and as a way that takes it forward rather than backward looking? And um, because in the society right now, Sadly, politically, we don't have the emotional maturity of political leaders to engage in a grown up fashion with that conversation. It's a very important conversation where the universities, as part of his social impact, can have um, um, that conversation. Um, now, is, that's a very important conversation for society um, because without us dealing with our the brokenness, which is a legacy of apartheid, is very difficult to build the individual resilience and the agency that we need as a society oh. um, and the confidence for those who um, who've been disadvantaged in the past. So a part of the university's intellectual role is to rebuild on the individual and the emotional level and have that the, in, the intellectual contribution to deal with things like, you know, dealing with the past, but in the past in terms of inferiority complexes, there is a legacy of the past and superiority complexes, complexes is a legacy of the past and dealing with sort of the inner, you, you know, the inner life of the individual, which I have become concluded myself, is more important to the outer healthy life of individuals. But we don't have that intellectual debate about the inner life and, and, and building the inner life of the individual and the maturity on the in, inner life to get that agency, to get the resilience, to become better uh, democratic citizens and, 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 and better um, 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 a more well-rounded um, human be uh, be uh, um, beings. I mean, I just think about it. Just, just think about parenting, um, uh, or, 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 um, or rearing children in the context of what would be, what is it? Democracy in that context, most of maturity in that context, and uh, um, and 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 dealing with the legacy of the past when we have 
broken families and broken communities that cannot deliver, you know, that message. And how does the university get into that space to help uh, in, in those, you know, how to be human, um, in, uh, which we are struggling with now in the country. And that's why we have so many problems, violence, GBV, um, um, and, and so on. Well, another thought provoking uh, take on this when dealing with the past, you say, let's have a very site specific approach and not a holistic approach. I'm sure you'd open another bit of can of worms there, but I'd love to hear from the audience with regard to that. But also very encouraging, though, you when you say it's a co learning um, process that should uh, be a germination of new ideas. Hopefully, that germination of new ideas will stimulate emotional and political maturity. Let's move on to Siobhan for a couple of uh, contributions from the floor. Siobhan. Thank you, Jerome. Um, so from the floor, we have a comment um, that is the perception at issue of the local is crucial. And at times it seems as if we see the local knowledge of spaces from a deficit view. Um, we tend to speak of diversity as a challenge and not so much as an opportunity. Um, an honest reflection is needed. That was a comment uh, made in the chat while you were responding, Prof Kumede. There are a few questions. Um, would you allow me to, to raise the four questions that I've picked up? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. What is the relationship between social impact and transformation in your view? At SU, it appears those uneasy and uncomfortable with transformation would rather be involved in social impact activities, which are very broadly defined from soup kitchens to research informed by key societal challenges. How do we decolonize social impact beyond missionary handouts? Feel good voluntary work when we do what we want, uh, what work we do when we want to, excuse me. The next question was, what role does vulnerability play in improving an institution's social license to operate? An example, creating spaces for dialogue in communities or simply spaces to listen. Another question was, what could be the next level for a research university like SU? And what would the implication be for social impact at Stellenbosch University? Um, final question that I could pick up was, um, or two questions was how do universities deliver social impact beyond handouts? Um, similar to the first question I asked, project based manner, and how do we use social impact to drive transformation within the university? Thank you, Jerome. I mean, my view uh, obviously of social impact is, um, is, is to make an argument for much more broader um and um and social impact will, will include transformation um so you know social impact um i think um is not just a, a you know small aspect um, um that should be reserved um for a unit um in a university uh you know i think it's must broadest all of the issues um you, you know i mentioned but most probably, I think, importantly, is the universities as part of the social impact role will have to look at what is transformation. I mean, is transformation appointing black people into positions? Is transformation giving slices of um, of companies, um, you know, to black people? What is transformation? I think there's a very big part, I think, of the university's responsibility in terms of the intellectual question, um, because I see transformation is much, much, much more broader. And transformation is, of course, includes obviously dealing with the past, but transformation also deals um, with dealing with the present, which may not be anything to do with the past. Um, and transformation is to deal with the future, you know, this um, the coming future, the change with its technology uh, um, and, you know, all of the dilemmas of the present and the future. And that really is a engagement, a transformation engagement in South Africa potentially most probably is so narrow that it undermines our economic growth, it undermines our, our own our well, well being. Uh, being. Um, as a country as and communities as individuals, because it's so narrow focus um, on a black white issue, 
rather than much more broader. How, for example, the transformation is also how to be a man in the context of vulnerability, in the context of democracy, in the context of the values of the constitution. Um, you know, what is maleness or, 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 and you know, those, all of those things are transformation. Um, you know, how do we deal with our cultures or parts of our cultures are absolutely irrelevant or are obstacles um, to our own well-being? Um, so, you know, those are the debates, um, which is also part of transformation um, and, and also part of so, so, uh, uh, um, an impact and maybe also part of the decolonization um, um, in South, because the decolonization, I uh, want to argue is also to reimagine us as human beings now and for the future. What kind of human beings do we want to be? And it doesn't mean we want to be human beings that were based in the past, on the things of the past. We want to be human beings in the present and human beings that are healthy and inclusive and emotionally healthy and inner healthy, uh, also resilient. Um, and that is also uh, um, a part of, of, um, of his, and also, um, but still obviously the transformation is to, you know, what new memories to be built? What is a, a new identity to be South African, to be African? Um, and, uh, and so on. And how do we engage with the past pain? Um, in a way that is healing for ourselves individually, but also um, that is healing for society broadly, but is also learning for others who are not South African, outside South Africa, uh, other societies that also grapple uh, with with um, 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 with the same um, um, with the same um, um, with the same um, issues, and and maybe lastly, I mean, there was a question about vulnerability. And I think, how do we accept vulnerability as, as strength? To be, to be vulnerable as strength and to be openly vulnerable as transformation. And, mm. you know, those kind of debates. Um, thank you, Professor. We, we have about 10 minutes left, and um, I'm sure the questions are uh, are still there. We'll have an indication from, from William, at least from Siobhan, shortly. But on that point, just very, very quickly, um, we, we speak of a triple challenge in South Africa, referring to the inequality, poverty, and unemployment. Um, uh, suffice it to say, I think we should add a fourth one, also referring to the lawlessness in South Africa, and perhaps I talk about henceforth a quadruple challenge of South Africa. How, how do how do you foresee uh, uh, the impact of this is on the psyche of communities and from a university's viewpoint in particular uh, down in the Western Cape? Cape Town is seen as the the, the 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 criminal or the murder capital of the country. How how can a university like Salamosh University impede in a positive way um, on that psyche of communities? Um, I, I'm going to try to be a little so on, a, on a practical side. I think one responsibility is not only of Stanford University, but also all universities. I mean, our, our legacy of the past, obviously, is not everyone will have the kind of education to go to university. So how do we also have other kinds of programs um, with a bridge? Um, the lack of education to take, you know, to enter into the normal programs in our, in our community. So how do we, what other, you know, how do we expand um, what is normally called, um, you, you know, sort of personal development type of courses and so on and extra curricula and so on. Um, so that I think universities will have to offer more non-traditional academic offerings also to their communities as part of the reparations. 
and then to, yeah. do, to do more non-traditional programs with for communities without sort of the background in education to deal with let's just say violence or mediation in gangs um, for the issues uh, um, for those you know with all of the issues that our communities are struggling with so that's going to be important practical intervention as part of um, social impact I'm going to leave it there, Professor William Gumedi. I mean, I think the answer in short is very, very sharp and very uh, to the point that we need to venture into non-traditional means uh, to speak to that. Um, let's move over to Siobhan for a last round of questions or contributions. Siobhan. Thank you, Jerome. Um, there is a, I'm not sure if it's a question or a comment in particular, but it, it's asking or saying, should SI and transformation not also deal with black pain and exclusion in the present? Um, and then there's st still high appreciation coming through from Prof Kupman's side. We acknowledge that and some comments from our guests, uh, Eleanor, indicating that 50 years is a long time to be ignored. Um, and we have to take hands and address the elephant in the room so that we can make the impact and turn it around. Um, Jerome. Well, thank you very much and thank you for the appreciation, the word of appreciation coming through. We are nearing the end before we ask uh, Professor Gumedi for a take home message. Just to reply to that very interesting. Speak to the elephant in the room, Professor Gumedi. And black pain in the present. Professor. You know, I, I, let me let me end maybe with a black pain because it, it is um, um, uh, quite um, important. Crusoe, um, how do I respond to it? Um, I, I took an invitation to speak in an event um, um, coming in two weeks, and I'm very afraid um, um, to make that speech. And I've put a draft together, and, it was, and it's about black pain. And I'm making an argument that could we, could we foster almost um, a social movement to deal with, with with healing of the past and with pain of the past? And where would we, would we start? And could we start with engendering love and self, you know, starting with self-love. And how does one teach self-love at a mass level, community level, it's a mass level, so as part of, of, of healing um, the society and how does the university get involved in this space? And then secondly, how do we do forgiveness for ourselves and for others in a different way um, in order to move on and of course all of those things will have to be linked to the you know more innovative ways of reparations from institutions you, you know it has to be it has to be more imaginative um, um, than currently um, um, is the case um, but universities have more tools to deal with the, with the pain of the past um, and one of the reasons why we have the crisis in society, the crisis of, of the inability to deal with the past, because we don't deal with the pain of the past and we don't heal or begin at least the process of healing. And, and we do it in such a way which is inclusive, but it's not in a way that we victimhood or anger or resentment. And how does the university intellectually lead that process? So a healing that is not based on victimhood, and a healing that is based on agency, and a healing that is based on love, 
and a love that goes for oneself and a love that goes for others, whether they don't look like one or don't speak like one or don't come from the same community um, from one and, and, and one that provides individuals with agency, you know, with the idea that, you know, one can do something no matter how dire one's circumstances and for the university to provide practical courses and things like that um, for people to engage um, in that space of healing. So healing much more, this, the way I want to look at healing is much more broad based, um, obviously. Thank you so much for the invitation. God bless. Before you go, before you go, well, yeah. if it hadn't been for your other engagement, I would have arrested you for another couple of minutes, Professor Gomez. No, you can. But yeah. in 20 seconds, in 20 seconds, um, have we adequately addressed the elephant in the room? I'm or sorry, is that I, ongoing, I didn't really understand is that the elephant in the room. Is that an ongoing process? Oh, I, 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 please just explain to me. I didn't really understand the question the um, of the elephant in the room question. Let's pull in Siobhan. Siobhan. Sure. Uh, thank you, Jerome. Jerome, just one last request, Prof. Kumede. There is a question also um, from our DVC, um, and uh, the rectors also is, uh, re supported that question. But in terms of the elephant in the room, the comment was made that um, hanging on the good old days is not working, and we should learn from the past. Um, but there, for 50 years is a long time to be ignored. So the two biggest you know, uh, or rather, if you take hands and address the elephant in the room, you, you can make an impact. That was the comment um, to turn it around in just uh, I get it. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I get it. Um, so very, very short for me in terms of the, the role of the university in that context, elephant in a room, is for me is not the first element is not to to hang on to the good old days of the past. That really is important. Second one, not to hang on to victimhood of the past. Yes, of course, horrible things happen to disadvantaged communities, but not to hang on and not to be imprisoned by that. So the old good, good old days, um, the victim you know, of the past. And then the third one is for the university to acknowledge the pain of the past and the privilege of the past and the present. Um, is going to be um, uh, important, and 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 maybe lastly, how do we get out of the anger and out of resentment? Um, and how do we the how does the university engage in that sp space to get out of com you know communities and individuals out of an anger? space and obviously anger is legitimate um resentment is legitimate um these are very illegitimate emotions but for agency and for building and for healing is not necessarily good because it undermines individual healing and communal healing and societal large healing so for me is how does intellectually the university gets into that engagement space imaginatively. The, I come up with the ideas um, in that space because these are really difficult, very difficult spaces. They're not ready-made answers. The past cannot be a guide um, and, and we have to innovate and we have to think um, mm. um, 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 differently. And that really is, a, I think, one of the challenges for the university to be in that space. Professor Gimedi, we're going to conclude with the final question over to Siobhan. Thank you. Um, the question is, please, could you give some pointers for the restitution imperative of universities like Stellenbosch? And perhaps in your closing, just say a bit more about the remark that universities should be alternative governments. Thank you, Jerome. Um, on restitution, I mean, you really just practical ones. Um, uh, um, Obviously, you know, the, the, the real practical ones is that people have been overlooked in the past to recognize them, to see them, um, to see their families and the communities who haven't been seen, to see them. And seeing means to engage with them and to think with them and to imagine with them. And, and where the university's resources, whether it's intellectual resources or other kinds of resources, um, can help the unseen. 
So even the intellectual thinking of new ways and new imaginative ways of doing things in those communities is seeing them is part of the issue of restitution. And then also for those um, inside the university space to see people who hasn't been seen before. And by seeing them is to engage with them um, um, and so on. I, I mean, it's I'll give you an example of a mining company which I've, I, I worked with and engaged with or would ask me to engage with him. And one of the things I, I engaged with him was in, to look at families who worked, for example, in the past or people in whose families are in destitu destitution. Can a mining company do something for the children? That's really practical, almost um, immediate. Sometimes something as pension fund unclaimed um, and somebody's in destitute, can an institution act to do that um, and, and, and you, you know engage in that uh, uh, process? Can the university actually help with the healing of individuals in its own setup, staff and employees? Um, in that healing, I mean, I know we call it wellness, we and so on, psychological healing, but the university's responsibility to help with personal healing. And then also to begin to think imaginatively how it can help with the healing of the communities around itself in its catchment um, 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 area. Um, but again, you, you know, um, as an outsider, I cannot tell the university because the resources sits within the university and the imagination sits within the university and the capabilities in the university's context. Um, but that is uh, uh, it, it, the imagination um, to heal within the organization, to help with healing outside the organization and to help with healing uh, of the past and then to help with healing in the intellectual space um, of the society um, at large. 20 seconds, can universities be alternative governments? Um, yes, um, in terms of not necessarily alternative governments, but you know, of of behaving in the way we want the ideal South Africa to behave inclusive, respectful of that inclusivity, treating people with respect, um, good leadership, um, seeing people, um, looking after people looking after the community um, um, you know, around it, bringing the community into the university where the community also become part of the university, coming with alternative um, healing processes and so on. So all of that is a package, I think is you know, providing that alternative um, way of living, engaging, of governing um, and of being human. Professor William Gumedi, you've left us with uh, something to ponder on. In fact, to start off with perhaps in our next session when we have our panelists uh, stating their problem statement um, in terms of uh, the role that universities can play as a well in the governmental space, and that is leadership, the whole package that can be. Let's ask them then perhaps if they have time to unpack that. It's been an awesome experience with you uh, for the past almost two hours. Thank you so much and uh, for this thought provoking and very insightful uh, presentation. Um, I said we are, have uh, sort of gone over our lot of time with you and uh, you have another engagement. Until next time, I know you would have loved to have been down here in, in Cape Town. I mean, this is home to you after all. <laughs> so any reason or excuse to come back home and breathe in the energizing air of Cape Town, <laughs> perhaps at it next time. Professor William Kamedi from Bits University, thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, um, on that note, we're going to have a strict five minute body break. And when we do come down, I'll introduce our panelists and uh, we will afford them an opportunity to state their problem statement and then open the floor thereafter. See you in five minutes. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, let's um, settle down and um, gear and ready ourselves for the next session. And now we're moving on to our panel discussion, and uh, we have no less than five panelists, after which we will have 
a closing remark session to conclude the session. Um, we've had a wonderful presentation done by our keynote speaker earlier on. I'm, th I'm sure a lot of thoughts, a lot of questions that emanated from that. And please reserve those, those who didn't get through uh, during our first session. I'm sure our panelists would also be able to speak to that. Allow me to give the following to you in terms of social impact, in terms of what's stated um, by Stanford. Social impact is how an organization or an institution or wherever you find yourself being in an organized setup, how people's actions can change or affect the surrounding communities. I think that was very evident in the presentation we had earlier on. Now we have our panelists and between two and a half to three minutes, they will state their problem statement and uh, we can rigorously interact thereafter and try to get to the bottom of whatever would work for us. Let's explore that. Without any further ado, allow me to present the first panelist to you. Our panelists received a PhD. He received a PhD in business administration from the University of Cape Town and is the head of social impact and member of the management committee at the University of Stellenbosch Business School. He is responsible for leading USB's social impact philosophy and strategy and oversees the execution of social impact processes, programs, and projects. He's a senior lecturer on the MBA Business in Society module on community engagement, quality and integrity in leadership on the PG Diploma in Leadership with a focus on uh, NPOs, and lectures on the MPhil Future Studies program about the purpose of business in society. His professional interests include inclusion in workplace diversity with a specific focus on disability, nonprofit management and leadership and social impact education. As the lead author is work on student reflections entitled Transformative Learning Through Social Engagement, Reflections on Responsible Leadership Development in Management Education, received the Best Paper Award at the International Business Conference in 2019. And as an avid and dedicated practitioner, he had spent more than two decades in the nonprofit sector in various capacities and continues to consult in the very sector. Delegates, I present to you Dr. Armand Bam. Good morning, colleagues, and uh, thank you for um, your engagement thus far, I was quite inspired by Prof Gumedi's um, delivery. But I want to start off with saying that I believe we all can agree that the role of universities in society is receiving more attention in light of the global challenges impacting on poverty, inequality, climate, environmental degradation, prosperity, peace and justice that needs to be tackled. And as central characters within society, these institutions are considered to generate societal values. They are considered as the transmitters of knowledge, preparing our workforce, while at the same time balancing this notion of being the educational homes for the elite. But I want to suggest that these institutions have a far more critical role to play beyond that of conduits of information and appliers of knowledge. And so we need to rid ourselves of this intellectual lethod lethargy. And we need these institutions to move beyond traditional roles of creating and applying knowledge and become active change agents delivering on the social justice Prof. Gomedi speaks of. And so for the purposes of this dialogue, I would like to make three statements regarding the notion of divining social impact within tertiary institutions. Firstly, before we can speak about reimagining social impact, there's, a, there's far more work to be done on imagining what a balanced, inclusive, just and fair society looks like. We have failed to adequately develop a collective understanding of what this means and the tacit expressions that support this understanding. We have become too comfortable in our ivory towers and too far removed from the real issues at hand to make the bold claims that we do. And so the legitimacy with which we act remains questionable. 
when we are not effecting positive change to what is so obvious in our communities. Secondly, within academic institutions, the manner in which we recognize, reward and incentivize transformative social impact requires re-engineering. We should not expect radical change in our societies when research, teaching and learning and social impact remain siloed. Social impact must be seen and delivered through our research, teaching and learning and citizenship. And I want to suggest that too many academics are building careers in these institutions instead of building communities. Thirdly, what are we measuring and for whom? Far too often in tertiary institutions, we find that how we define and deliver social impact is more intimately tied to rankings, ratings, and reputation than the required changes in our communities. We need to look no further than our own doorstep in a town like Stellenbosch, surrounded by the communities of Clutisville and Kaimandi, to see the economic, environment, environmental, and social inequalities that persist. And so in conclusion, I want to suggest that the eradication of these inequalities should be the first measure of a transformative social impact experience before it is that we speak to our global repute. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed Bam. Very interesting points to the fore there. And again, also equally as thought provoking, just to quickly cap, recap on what you have touched on. You started out by unpacking the institution's role in dealing with social impact. And we can we can really talk about this and to also link that to what was said earlier on. You mentioned that we need to rid ourselves with the intellectual lethargy. Um, now that really can be can be debated, and I'm looking forward to particularly a question could come about that. Um, and to what extent is that lethargy prominent? Um, and how do we re-energize uh, the, the intellectual roles that are being played? Also, you say more work needed to, to, to be done around the, the balancing uh, uh, of um, and the unpacking of uh, 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 effecting just societies, uh, inclusive societies, etc. A recognition you, you touched on but that needed to be afforded. Uh, also talked about the rankings, the measurements and the ratings. Uh, in other words, well, I could I could hear that you were asking, but what is the end goal, in fact, in, in moving towards that? And you were concluding by making your suggestion. Well, let's let's keep it there. And uh, as Siobhan is monitoring the questions that um, or suggestions that uh, come in uh, with regards to your in, your input input, let's move on to our next speaker. Thank you very much, Dr. Bam. Delegates, our next panelist holds a PhD. If I could just do that, because I've been reprimanded, please put your camera on. <laughs> now I do that. You know, if you come from radio, then also radio gesichter, we try to sway from cameras. So our next panelist holds a PhD in education, centered around a participatory action research approach towards contextualizing a framework of understanding and supporting the work of the community volunteers in a community school. Now, he, uh, he also has held the directorship uh, position for the Center for the Community School at Mandela University, which endeavors to interact with multiple stakeholders through collaborative teaching and learning, engagement, and scholarship processes. Also, our panelist is a member of the Mandela University Food Systems Secretariat. Now, before being appointed director of the engagement office, he had led the institution's hub of convergence uh, program within the engagement and transformation portfolio. The hub of convergence endeavors to co-create physical spaces where the university meets the community to engage on common platforms in finding solutions to problems that affect our immediate communities. I like also Lepa up because he can't wait to share with us that knowledge. He's, he's the co-founder <laughs> co of the Manjano School Network and held lecturing responsibilities at the university. Now, before being appointed at Nelson Mandela University, he I was a minister. He held the position of principal at Sapphire Road Primary School 
Uh, you notice how the, the after clock there uh, in Port Elizabeth, he says, but now if memory serves, the Becha. I hope I get the king right. And he's been there for 15 years. Delegates, I present to you Dr. Bruce Damon. Thank you so much, Director Oakley, and, uh, and for, for that warm introduction and good morning, colleagues. Um, Siobhan, if you can start sharing the, the presentation, please. So the problem statement perhaps I pose now, listening to Prof Kumedi and, and, and the, the DVC as well as the rector, is um, we are the voices of the people we intending to impact in today's conversation. And I want to proposition uh, uh, um, Jerome that we have to start moving. I think that has been alluded to by a number of speakers and comments beyond the university languaging. So on the 26th of August uh, this year, last week, we had an engagement with two community-based organizations, one working in Salauris Pass, close to you, and the other across Nelson Mandela Metro. Both these organizations was, they have, sorry, more than six years experience in collaborating both with Nelson Mandela University as well as Stellenbosch University. So the reflections um, through this PowerPoint, so I won't be speaking over the PowerPoint and perhaps <laughs> almost as a, a, a metaphor or something of the, of the absent voice, presents some critique from these organizations um, on the relationship that they've been having with us as universities, celebrating the agency of what is there and what has been achieved in the collaboration um, offer, they also, we also offer some ideas to consider around deepening the, our collaboration with various uh, stakeholder communities as we strive to understand how to be of greater service to society. So what we'll do now is we'll, we'll show the PowerPoint presentation without any talk over and then I'll conclude in, in 15 seconds, Jerome. Um, could you just go back quickly, please, uh, uh, Siobhan? Right, just, I'll tell you when to move. Jerome, I think my our engineers, you will be extremely satisfied that I could do something within three within three minutes. But I think those are some of the reflections from the engagement that we have on our community, especially partners that we have been engaged with in some in over some period of time in really deepening in the conversation. So the key question that so that sits um, in tension, including some of the comments from Prof Komedi is can we truly have these conversations without the communities we intending to impact? Thanks. Well, Dr. Damons, I need to, to express the following. That must have been the most efficient and most productive PowerPoint presentation I have ever witnessed. But that's only, that's only, that, that's the way the men's have by that can do. And I love the accent. Nokhidi accent of Kaliri. Thank you very much. Dala what we must, brother. Dala what we must. <laughs> <laughs> well, Thanks. you have started out by uh, highlighting the fact that we have to, have to move beyond university languaging. And that also came through very strongly early on. And in recognizing the assets and lessons from an existing engagement that you have illustrated there, the questions beg for argument's sake, you know, what are those um, uh, engagements, those assets that you highlighted? You have mentioned them, but I'm more interested in what are the game-changing ones? The eight skitters, 
and if you could elaborate on that uh, later on. And um, you, you also alluded to the fact that, um, you know, reimagining for who and for whom. Um, yes, I, I think you, perhaps one can anticipate, perhaps you are stating the obvious, but I don't think it's that simple. Thank you very much, Dr. Damons. And again, uh, underlining the fact that that must have been, uh, like I said, the most efficient and most productive PowerPoint presentation I've ever witnessed. Thank you. And delegates, now we move on to our next panelist. Our next panelist is an accredited CEDR, um, of course, the UK there, and a conflict dynamic in South Africa, the, that qualification and mediator. So again, she's an accredited CEDR and a conflict dynamic uh, mediator and ThoughtSmith certificate coach. She also provides support to heads of department, heads of schools, and deans in navigating the complexities of social justice and anti-discrimination works at the University of Advertisement. She's interested in the practices of transformation within contextual and epistemological, there we go, epistemological diversity. Her works include anti-discrimination investigations and alternative dispute resolution, grant proposal writing for academic transitions and academic citizenship training on black academics, also social justice interventions and awareness training, stakeholder engagements there and employment equity and triple BEE. Our panelist chairs the Institutional Forum at WITS and is a member of the university's council. She has also served as the ministerial representative on the UNISA council, as well as the ministerial team, which led to the establishment of the University of Mpumalanga. She has 25 years of experience in higher education with 14 years at executive and senior management level in the university, government and the non-governmental sector. She has also worked on the National Committee for the Next Generation of Black Scholars Program, which formed the foundation of the now NGAP program in universities. Other areas include her work at Palama facilitating strategic planning, strategic leadership and change management to a senior government official in South Africa, Lesotho, Burundi, South Sudan and Rwanda. She has also worked at the Southern Research and Innovation Managers Association, or SARIMA, as research project manager. As an academic associated with the WITS School of Education, she continues to supervise postgrad students and remain research active. Delegates, I present to you Dr. Bernadette Johnson. Thank you, Jerome. I think I've got lots to learn from Bruce. Um, thanks for the introduction. And I just want to thank uh, colleagues like Ernestine. Thanks for including me in, in this process, as well as co colleagues from CEISEF. I see a lot of colleagues from CEISEF here, the South African Higher Education Community Engagement Forum, um, colleagues from Stellenbosch, and of course, William and his presentation. So, um, Jerome, you got me thinking about a problem statement and I quickly just thought up one. I hope it um, assists me and I'm not going to be as efficient as, as Bruce, but all I think all universities need to be engaged in, in social impact, um, especially within the developing context. And so I'm thinking here specifically around poverty and inequality, hunger and social justice. And as universities, we may have varying other dimensions. But I wonder whether all universities necessarily need an explicit social impact function. Um, and that might be strange for me to say, having worked and been part of CEDISEF. Um, the past three or so years, having come back to BITS and uh, playing the role now in the transformation office, and no, we don't just see it as employment equity at triple BE. Uh, we it's extended into uh, all forms of discrimination, uh, fighting that, um, including um, bullying. And recently we've adopted um, a policy against bullying. 
Why I mention this is that I think the first point I want to make about social impact, and whenever I think about Wits and Stellenbosch, I almost think of us as at the opposite ends of a political spectrum. And so when I say this, I want to make the point that at, at Wits, Wits is known for a place and uh, where people are drawn to because either they uh, they liberal, I find they socialists or they communists or they somewhere on the left poli political spectrum. And it's linked, of course, to the point William makes about the past, the present and the future. We grapple with the past and Wits has done a lot in grappling with the past, more than 60%, um, I want to say, across the board, staff, and students are, are black and the university is representative of the South African context. Um, when we have cases, and this is an illustrative example around racism, for example, uh, you will find it's two black women, one woman accusing the other woman of racism, as an example. And the racism here is you embody the being of a of a white male of record. Uh, person and so and you are patriarchal and racist so and then of course the way it expresses at Stellenbosch uh, takes a different form and we've recently had experiences of that even academically um, too where we think about uh, around research we may think we've we've discussed at WITS for example uh, the incident that happened at Stellenbosch in our Academic Freedom Committee, and we distilled it as academic integrity. And I leave it there. I can't cover all the points, but it raises the point around ethics for me. And that essentially we need to, uh, ethics is a major issue. Um, cheating among students is a major issue, especially online. And so we're doing a lot of work around integrity. The point I'm making about political extremes so at WITS, we don't have an explicit social impact um, or community engagement function that's being developed. The function that we do have is around WITS community outreach. And the work that gets done there, we can characterize as social development work. So it gets, it focuses on student poverty, student hunger. We, for example, feed a thousand students every day from our council controlled budget. Um, we do work in the space of social justice, and I want to make the point related to the failed state here. Everything we're currently doing in our assessment of it, and we've got a, a 2033 vision, is we are saying to ourselves, we cannot just play, it's important to play a leadership role, but we almost need to, and we need to model, but we need to go beyond that. We need to be exemplary. We need to show that it's possible to run a university without corruption. We must live that, we must be that, high ethics, um, high morals. We need to show that in our social justice work, we are able to teach and schools are able to learn from us. When our students go out there, they are able to be leaders in that space of social justice. 20 seconds. That yeah, and that diversity and inclusion is not necessarily, we have, we engage with those notions because we have to be conscious and careful that it's not, we're not avoiding racism in the language of diversity. So the point I want to make, and I see you there now, Chair, I've, I've, I've just begun, but maybe to conclude, the essence of what I'm saying is we don't have an explicit function. It's because it's embedded in our DNA. It's in our total being. So when we think of the system, if Stellenbosch is stronger uh, in its social responsibility and what it does, it makes Wits stronger. If Wits is stronger in what it does, it makes Stellenbosch stronger. Thank you. And so the I just want to conclude is by saying that we need to get to the whole heart, the soul and the self of what it means, what it is we are wanting to be as Stellenbosch what it is we are wanting to be as wits. And unless we interrogate the DNA of who we are, we're not going to, um, social impact runs the risk of becoming, of remaining project-based and programmatically based.
Thanks very much, Dr. Johnson. Appreciate it. And uh, very, very valid, valid points. And again, uh, those points that need to be delved into and unpacked later on. Suffice to say that you have started out by identifying and for the record stated, you don't have a dedicated, explicit social function at university. You look at it uh, in another fashion. Um, um, and I'll come back to that now. But you, very interestingly enough, um, identified the issue of bullying. A uh, question begs then, um, uh, the, the, the bullying and how does this relate um, to the, 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 the effect, affecting change within your institution um, or place of high learning uh, generically? Um, uh, the impact also, the fact that this is grappling with, uh, with the past, uh, indeed, perhaps because it's still perceived as a more colonized place of higher learning uh, than Fargham and Sextalamash University. Um, um, and then we can talk to that. Uh, why a bit more than that is a perception and there's merit to that? Or if not, then perhaps you can just elaborate on that also. Why are you grappling more uh, than uh, some uh, place like Salamash University? The issue of ethics, that is a major issue you said, and you unpacked that, and also the question of integrity. Um, um, coming back to no social impact, uh, functionality specifically per se. Insist, uh, instead, you are you are focusing on on the community outreach, uh, where issues like topical challenges are being addressed, and you've highlighted a few. Uh, for argument's sake, challenges that the community, uh, university community, is facing on a daily basis. You also alluded to your 20 to 33 vision, and um, um, you also managed to get to well, you scratched the surface of getting to the heart and the soul of your uh, intervention. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Johnson. And I'm sure, slowly but surely, our uh, uh, questions are on the rise and also our uh, contributions, uh, which is Siobhan is currently packing, and he will be packing them in perhaps groups of five uh, before we get uh, a response and then move on. And now time to move on to our next panelists. Our next panelist is Director Institutional Advancement uh, at Saul Plaque University. He's in charge of the overall advancement um, uh, strategy at the university. Uh, prior to joining Saul Plaque University, he had worked for a number of years, 10 years specifically, uh, to be specific at Rhodes University as manager in the development and fundraising department. Now, before Rhodes, he was with Ubuntu Pathways in uh, Tabeha as a director of external relations, public relations, stakeholder engagement, and marketing. Also oversaw the biggest capital uh, campaign for the building of the award-winning Ubuntu Center in Zvere Township. His proven ability to meet, as it states here, to meet fundraising goals along with his persuasive communication. Look at that smile. Um, I'm doing some marketing here for you, so yes, if you do get, yes, you can come and talk to me, I'll be your agent. His proven ability to meet fundraising goals along with his persuasive communication and networking skills and ability to engage with individuals and stakeholders at all levels. He um, ideally shaped him to dynamically impact any institution in the area of advancement. Now, from leading strategic planning efforts, plans and liaising with donors, in preparing annual budget and implementing development communication strategies, his background had consistently been characterized by steadfast dedication to managing fiscal responsibility and achieving organizational growth objectives. Currently, our panelist is applying his expertise as a director for many years at both university and a nonprofit organization to driving positive social change within higher education through the development of a community engagement office at Salt Lake University. This is some background, academic background on our panelists. He holds a BTEC uh, degree, Library and Information Sciences, also postgrad certificate in resources mobilization and advancement. And then he has a BA honors in corporate communications also have then an MBA at Rhodes University, which he's uh, embarking on in his final year. And then something that really intrigues me, our panelist 
is a qualified level three coach, rugby coach. Now, I think when you're done here, perhaps just consult with the people at, uh, at our national regional <laughs> rugby authorities and perhaps you can give those couple of tips to the boys down under in what awaits them in a two days time or so. Then in terms of community and professional development, chairperson, he is an advisory board for the Nelson Mandela Bay Science and Technology Center. Also board member of United Through Sport, which uh, the grassroots sports development and academy in the uh, township of Port Elizabeth or Trebecha. He's also founder of Grassroots Rugby in Section 21 entity committed to providing rugby playing opportunities for disadvantaged youth in the Eastern Cape. And our panelist is also co-founder and board member of Sport Revolution Trust in Trebecha. Delegates, I present to you Mr. Odankele Sompondo. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Jerome and um, and the colleagues. Of course, the um, the introduction was actually so long and it, it will definitely be longer than the uh, submission today. Um, um, the the context of um, my presentation today is really what I think is going to be um, around um, the definition of what is transformative social impact and 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 how to use that to um, hopefully conceptualize the university of the future. And as you know, um, social um, uh, SPU. Is, is 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 a new university and and we're setting up the office from the ground up and um, uh, we've done a lot of benchmarking and we went around um, to learn um, but what what to us is critical is because the university itself was formed as a as a social justice project, and and we 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 had to define this in the context of what a university is in a place like Northern Cape, where there was no university before, and and to us um, being a social justice project in that kind of environment, it means we have to talk about access, we have to talk about inclusion. Um, we also have to talk about building resilience, and and this is very the last point is very important because it is at the core of some of the programs that um, we are um, putting together um, to inform the 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 the, the social impact office. Um, I use transformative social impact or positive social impact um, um, very deliberate because um, it is important that we we move beyond the um, whole, um, you know, and I say PR because I'm in that space, but we move beyond that um, to give that meaning. Um, now, for us, Access inclusion and building resilience is is critical because we we had to say what is um, social impact in our context and 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 for us uh, we believe that we have to focus on depth rather than breadth of the impact and 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 this is very important because um, focusing on depth. Um, uh, rather than what I call breadth, because breadth has been um, the kind of traditional approach to um, uh, social impact or community engagement in higher education, you know, project based, um, you know, and, and I think that's a question I was posing to uh, Prof. Kumete earlier. Uh, how do you move beyond that? Um, how do you move beyond the mission of the institution? And 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 to us, we we said there's 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 quite a number of things that would indicate to us that we are focusing on depth instead of breadth, and we said we look at the context first, context and the place, 
Um, and 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 as far as the context is concerned, we're talking about you know how do you how do you deliver impact in 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 an environment of traumatized um, communities, you know, communities that feel. Uh, left out, you know, through colonialism, through apartheid, and currently communities that are dealing with really a, a failing state, or you know, that is, you know, uh, projects itself in a in a number of um, issues like you know, service delivery and 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 all these issues. And and the second thing that um, we we said we focus on, we focus on listening. Um, where community that is dealing with uh, pain, a community that is dealing with um, anger and stuff. So we focus on listening. You know, we we are in Northern Cape. We're dealing with the uh, people that were dealing with dispossession. They were dispossessed of their land. Everything. You know, we're dealing with the Koi and the Sen, um, and and that's us. That's who we are. And thirdly, uh, to us, twenty seconds step is collaborative agency, you know, what it means to co-create and build together. And and lastly is what I talked about, um, which is being deliberate in, 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 in our approach. So that's really um, what it means to us to focusing on depth um, instead of breadth in our social impact um, approach. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Sampondo, and what an intriguing focus to uh, finish off there. But in short, um, I got the impression that you're really carrying the world on your shoulders, but uh, but I read passion in that. I read that you, commitment and drive in that. When you commenced, you 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 had this concerned expression on your face and you really gave this big sign. Um, suffice it to say that you, you started out with a question and that question was, what is social transformation uh, or these, what is transformative social impact? That was your question. And really, really, that opens up the 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 the, the years of Canada, um, in terms of uh, what we can then go and explore. Ongoing processes in defining the process you were learning, you alluded to, because that's exactly what you are busying yourself. It's an ongoing process. Very intriguing. Also, you spoke of access uh, in uh, inclusion. That is the way that you need to follow, that you are following access inclusion, and building resilience. Uh, question begs then access inclusion um, uh, to what and building resilience uh, resilience against what um, is it unique to your demographics in the northern Cape there or is it uh, a generic uh, phenomenon or phenomena uh, on a national scale we are looking forward to uh, exploring that further thank you very much Mr Sampondo <clears throat> Now we move on to our next, our final panelist uh, before we engage our panel. Our panelist heads the Service Learning Division within the Directorate of Community Engagement at the University of the Free State. Having a PhD in higher education studies with specialization in the field of community engaged service learning, she is responsible in advancing the institutionalization and global networking of engaged scholarship. Her research focuses on using an integrated service learning practices approach for flourishing and uh, of engaged scholarship in community university research partnerships. She has presented various national and international conference papers and workshops and published her work in journal articles and book chapters. Delegates, I present to you Dr. Karen Fenton. Good morning. Thank you, Program Director. And I'm excited to join the social impact team at Stellenbosch University, the keynote speaker and the panel members. Um, however, I am not going to open with a problem statement, but speaking from a reimagined future oriented frame, share an opportunity statement and thereby looking at what model does our university and has it adopted to facilitate social impact. The UFS is a research-led, student-centered and regionally engaged university that contribute to development and social justice through the production of globally compet competitive graduates and knowledge. Um, we also support 
doing this, doing it through goal four of our strategy, we support development and social justice through engaged scholarship. And so therefore I'm stating that using the, the, the local lens of the sustainable development goals and in alignment with the African Union Agenda 2063 and the National Development Plan, how can we imagine social impact? And then um, we are in the knowledge business. The university is in the knowledge business and asking, are we focusing not too much on transformation? But asking, is transformation not a product? And is the reconstruction for social change not the catalyst towards transformation? And then I cannot help to ask the question about knowledge democracy and stating that community-based research is a catalyst for creating social impact. And through that community-based research, acknowledging different knowledges and different forms of knowledge and knowledges, towards creating social impact. And to do that, the focus would be on institutionalization of community university research partnerships. Briefly, that is what I put to the panel. Well, that's a very, very interesting, Dr. Karen Fender. Thank you so much. And brief, it was indeed suffice to say that uh, you did start very unconventional by not stating the problem statement but the opportunity statement that was very welcomed as well. Well, we can explore that further because you have touched on something that can be construed as perhaps a bit controversial. And so why are we focusing on the wrong thing? Is our focus perhaps misplaced? Why are we focusing on social impact and transformation? We are after all a business. Why don't we go about it entrepreneurially? Our keynote speaker had alluded to this earlier on. We need to become entrepreneurs. Universities should become entrepreneurs, et cetera, et cetera. So you've taken your marker from that, perhaps. Um, needless to say, very, very apt as well. So there we have it. Thank you very much, Dr. Fenton. We've had our panels giving their problem, albeit opportunity statement. And we are opening the floor now. Uh, if we do have any questions or comments or contributions, uh, we would welcome that now. Uh, so let's hear from Siobhan. Siobhan? Thank you, Jerome. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Jerome. Um, there are a few comments um, from the panel uh, presentations. One was building careers instead of building societies. Um, another was we need to rediscover how the national asset of higher education serves the public interest. Um, another highlight was reimagining for who and for whom. Um, another was the DNA of who we are, emphasizing the need for honest self-reflection and self-knowledge. And then in final comment here is public universities throughout the world is under neoliberal capitalist attack. In some circles, it is equated to a rise in fascism that silences and marginalizes critical voices. Is SI just not a nice to have to pacify critical voices? Jerome? Yeah, thank you so much. Perhaps we, we can we can handle this across the floor, but uh, in the next round of intervention or interaction, if we could direct our question or contribution at this, a particular speaker, um, which you are addressing or who you are addressing, uh, depending on the points that were made, we can we can open that to the panels uh, panelists. Um, and I would love to uh, go also my two cents in here, um, and this is why. But because I have Dr. Fenton in front of me. Uh, perhaps start out with you and then please the floor is open to the rest of the panel in so much as uh, with a comment made earlier on um, are we are we are we defining social impact the way it ought to be defined perhaps not you dr fenter because you did start unconventionally and you had a couple of um, uh, interesting points that you made with regard to this but is it the responsibility of a place of higher learning a university to, to take the lead in that regard. Someone did say uh, it's a social justice project. Uh, Saul Planky, you're the speaker before you. I, I would hazard to say, but not just Saul Planky University, but isn't all universities sort of a social justice project and don't they have the social responsibility to form and lead um, not only the immediate community, but have this knock on effect, et cetera? Um, uh you are referring that I should um, introduce the um, conversation? 
Yes, please. You can. You can. You can. I've got your beautiful face in front of me, so you can go ahead and respond, and then we can hand over to uh, any of the other panelists to take over from you. Yes, thank you, Program Director. I think I'm going to allude again to the um, vision of the university that states that the UFS is a research-led, student-centered and regionally engaged university. And that brings us that we can support social impact through development and social justice and doing that through engaged scholarship. So in that sense, societal impact, I'm wondering if I, I just need to get to that slide, we would say that societal impact refers to the value that knowledge adds to society across various spheres, whether social, economic or environmental. And societal impact reflects the direct or indirect relationship between the knowledge agenda, its process and the improvement in the quality of people's lives, inclusive of innovation, technological advancements, improved sustainability and policy developments. And then leading to that, the knowledge impact that leads and that, that um, collaborates and co-travels with societal impact is that um, it alludes to scientific advances in understanding, interpretation, the methods that we use, theories, application, and related advances that bring about positive change within and across disciplines and fields. And then relating that to societal impact to the broader society, we can then say that it is not just lip service, and that it can become actioned through engaged scholarship. Um, let's move on to Dr. Mr. Simpondo, and please, the delegates, you're all welcome to chirp in here, as also as well as the um, the points that came from the floor. Mr. Simpondo, I'd like to just hone in on your your utterance about you having to access, or the challenge I could deduce in access inclusion. Um, what is the phenomenon currently like? Is there some form of access exclusion? And uh, why the resilience? Um, thank you so much, Jerome. Um The way um, we we define at SPU um, uh, social justice is is through those three core um, uh, uh, terms. You know, creating access and ensuring access where there was none, and and ensuring inclusion. And and this is. This for us is critical because the the point I'm making below is about context and place, um, because because being the first and the only university in Northern Cape with a clear mission, um, um, a, a that of of course the traditional mission of a university, which is to um, generate knowledge and um, you know graduate uh, um, uh, people, but engage citizen. But for us. That engaging, we want to flip around and say, when we talk inclusion, we say, how do you ensure that communities participate um, in the space that we find our in? Look, the 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 past um, is, is telling us that community engagement has always uh, been driven from the university and benefiting the universities, but but what has not been um, very clear is the value of um, indigenous knowledge, uh, value of, uh, so what is it that people uh, derive from this kind of thing? And that's what, when we talk about inclusion, we talk about that. When we talk about building resilience, resilience because we decide to be positive about this. And we are saying, when you are working in a in a society that is navigating pain, uh, anger, and you know um, um, a, a trauma, it is important to uh, shift the focus, but use what they used um, to transition through that, which is the resilience. I mean, you you went through colonialism, you went through apartheid, you went through all of that, and and you made it. And, and to us, that's resilience. But we have to ensure that those that we deal with currently, they get, I mean, we're not going to, and that's why we talk about the depth and, and not breadth of yes. um, impact. We say okay, those that you. comes through us, they have to have these three elements. Thank you, Mr. Sampondo. Um, I'd like to go to Dr. Damons after this, but I saw a reaction from you, Dr. Fenter. And colleagues, please feel free to, to, to really join the discussion here. 
Uh, Dr. Fender, did I see a, a gesture from you that you wanted to react? Okay, all right. Um, now, there's a strong, all good. Uh, you can open your mics, uh, 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 provided that you discipline yourself with regards to Beiklanke, all the noises from outside. Uh, Dr. Damons, um, Mr. Samfondo has got a very strong footprint in your province, uh, albeit that he plays around in the Northern Cape now. Um, is that where he all these approaches? And the, do you replicate all these things? I take it that's where it emanated at Rhodes and that it's like a stone throw away from you, or do you, do you do things differently? Do you also have those challenges as he identified now? I think if we South Africans, uh, um, Mr. Opry, we face with these challenges wherever we find ourselves, 70, 70 to 80% of society is confronted with these historical and contemporary challenges as Prof Kumedi um, reminded us. And I want to say the the responses has been rich both from institution and communities. The Eastern Cape has a rich history of generating fantastic scholars like Dr. Sapondo and others and leaders of this country. I bleed some of the challenges that we have even as a province. And I think it's within that tension that we constantly try to make sense of what the better response is. So I just want to go back to the point of us thinking as universities on our role in the space and questions that we we, we grappling with as Nelson Mandela universities is questions of our cultures and our, our exclusionary, perhaps um, subconscious, conscious tactics that we use to, to promote exclusion. I'll use an example for, for example of language. I said, Dala, what we must as a, as a closing comment to, to my input as well. And we find it is such a rich resonance in being able and a deep root that we can and say is doing what we have with what we doing, what we can with what we have where we are. And that speaks to the resilience um, Dr. Sapondo sp spoke about. So what are we doing to exclude communities from participating actively, not only in the discourses of society, I would support the, the comment that was the, the instead of social impact, societal impact, but how are we allowing communities to impact the discourses of the university? And then I also take, uh, take uh, 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 and, I, and sometimes you must learn to set intention even on these spaces, even your, your, your assertion, uh, Mr. Opley, as, as the, the, the facilitator, that the universities, what is the core business of the university? And I'm sure if you look at all the languaging of all of our institutions, they are extremely progressive in being very societal change. But still, when we have to default and we have to put ourselves through discomfort, we seem to default to our safe harbor. And I think historically, we're given the time really to sit in a bit of discomfort and gaze in serious critical discourses with everyone that will be impacted by change, not only a sector of society, because as a community member reminded us in one of our engagement seminars, remember, you are part of society. You always position yourself as an external part that does not seem to form part of society. Good. And you need to function and think in that particular way. Thank point taken, a very strong point there. Let's move on to what's perceived then. You were mentioning progressiveness and what is perceived by far as a very, very progressive institution of higher learning is WITS. Um, I'd be very surprised, Dr. Johnson, if you're sitting and grappling with the same challenges as uh, SPU, and to an extent, um, uh, Nelson Mandela as well. Yeah, so the point I was making earlier is, which I feel didn't come across clearly, is we don't have a social impact function or community engagement function that's uh, very elaborative and as, as in many other institutions. and. I've been sitting with that for the past three years. Why don't we have this? Why don't we have this? And as I've looked and posed those questions from a transformation point of view, I get the same answer. And when I look at the history of the university, I get the same answer. And the answer here is, and when I've had discussions with Adam Abib, I get the same answer. When you do excellent research and teaching and learning, by virtue of striving for excellence, the work you do will lend itself to being engaged, to being impactful. It will automatically, the highest form of intellectual work, knowledge work, 
is in fact impactful, whether it's politically, socially, environmentally, economically, culturally, it is impactful. And so that is that is the powerful point. And if you look at historically, WITS has always been disruptive, has always gone against the grain, has always tackled the 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 constructors and the architects of apartheid, has fought against that is now also reimagining itself as a leadership. And it's interesting how William and I haven't spoken, but we've had those conversations at WITS. We have made decisions that we need to look at the present, the past and the future. Our past from a transformation point of view is addressing equity and triple BE. These are also compliance and legislative requirements. The presence is that we grapple with discrimination. We grapple with bullying. We are a microcosm. It's happening in the schools. We must be exemplary. We must grapple with the future today, climate change economic crises that we will be confronted with. So how do we remain sustainable? And so currently we're doing things like introducing a climate change short course for all students who come into the university first year. From the point of view of entrepreneurship and solution building, we, we tired of doing policy from the point of for the sake of policy. It must be for implementation. We're creating wetlands. Our infrastructure development is around the development of wetlands, looking at alternative forms of energy. We must fix ourselves internally and we cannot be reliant on the state because the state is failing. What we need to do is show the way forward and we can only show the way forward through being socially impactful in within ourselves. And I agree with Bruce that the idea of the community being outside the university, the way I see it is the community members do not walk onto the campus on a daily basis. We have students and staff walking there. And so we must make special effort to extend, but it cannot be just through talking to people. It's got to be through showing that we are ethical, we lead, we do, and so on. I think you get the point. No, absolutely. Very clear. And before we go on to Dr. Bam, just uh, in closing on this point that you've made now, how do you deal in spreading it outwardly? Because you need to deal with your internal brand as well, dealing with those prejudices and with that discrimination that you've mentioned. If you don't deal with it internally and stimulating your internal brand, forget about taking it outwardly and then stimulating a community or society. How do you do that? You see, there, there we had William today. Other universities will have people like William. He spoke about what he spoke about, and he works across the world. So he's taking it out. He's an excellent scholar. He's, he demonstrates doing, being engaged. So it's in the DNA of it. The function I'm in, I'm doing the work of transformation. I'm tackling racism. I investigate racism. I mediate I dis dispute alternative dispute resolution, healing, self-love. We do those things. We have difficult conversations to bridge the divides. One of the things that bothers me a lot is that we don't have many white African students studying at WITS. Hmm. Why do they go to Stellenbosch and to UP, for example? Well, um, why is it? And, and so people feel it's part of the thing of inclusion. It's part of how we're building a nation. It's part of how we engage with difference in a way that we do not excuse ourselves from tackling racism. Because I wonder, with reference to the point made by our keynote speaker earlier on, I wonder to what extent the farm and the church has anything to do with exactly that point. Let's move on to not to tap into the, um, the DNA of uh, Dr. Bam, but you seem to be the businessman uh, extraordinaire on this panel. Um, Dealing with society and dealing with economic drivers, what is it exactly that you do that really gives stature to, to, to be impactful within your community? And or what is it that you lack for arguments sake in not stimulating that within your community and not being impactful? Um, just before I, I respond to, to that, I want to come back to the point I made around uh, this um, intellectual lethargy. And it's this notion of seeing academic institutions as only that knowledge generation places. If you look at a university like Stellenbosch, it is more than that. 
it has access to resources. It is the heart of an economic hub. So it is not only a place for intellectuals to come and gather and theorize about social impact. It can deliver a whole lot more into a community. And so it holds the keys um, <laughs> to access a specific economy, right? It can open doors. So I just want to plant that notion of we need to move away from this idea that universities are just there for us to talk amongst ourselves about how it is that we want to define social impact. There are actually quite pragmatic approaches to delivering the impact. And I think that's what Bernadette is um, speaking about, how it is that one actually delivers that impact. So what is it that we, uh, or I've, I've experienced in terms of, um, and I'll speak from a business school perspective, one of our particular initiatives, and it's this notion of bringing, and Prof Kumeri, I think, made reference to it, creating more opportunities, opening up your university and developing courses that, that don't only deliver certificates and degrees for the purposes, you know, of, of this whole academic journey. We run a small business academy uh, and um, at the business school, and we have three we had three locations. In the Eastern Cape, we have a hub uh, with over 20 uh, students that participate in this nine month program. Um, uh, in Stellenbosch, we have a, a, a program that's run and we call our Western Cape um, hub, which is uh, located at our Belleville campus. There's another hub. So there's, there's three almost within that region. We recently um, launched a Northern Cape chapter without fanfare. And the point was to take the university to the people. That is what we've got to do. So not create these barriers, make it inaccessible, put the price points at such a point that it really continues to be this elitist endeavor. So this notion of taking what we have, sharing the resources is what I want to bring across here. There are resources and information to share. It's not only about generating knowledge. I think that's what we do inherently. But to go beyond this idea, to break the shackles of um, th th that bonds us in this ivory tower, we need to go towards where it is that the communities need us. And so in the Northern Cape, it's quite interesting. Um, we've launched this academy. We've had over 20 participants in our first cohort. We have another 21 standing at the door waiting for us to launch. And so many interesting people who take pride with being associated with the university. You know, one of the stories is the lady who's been a herder, a sheep herder her whole life, 50 years old. We've taken the university to where the people are. And that's what I want to encourage when we talk about social impact initiatives or programs or courses, we've got to get out to where it is that it's needed. Coming back to the point made earlier on before we go onto our floor um, by a keynote speaker about uh, dealing with uh, from an entrepreneurial viewpoint and perhaps also by the same token, protecting your competitive edge. Uh, now I hear that we're moving on to each other's territories and how do we lose market share there? I'd love to hear from the others. Skadai Mansay Corp. So yes, let's go to Siobhan and hear who's on the floor. Siobhan. Program director, thank you. There are just um, comments coming through as um, our panelists are speaking. There are some questions raised and I think they're already being addressed in particular, like what is the DNA of Stellenbosch University? Um, what is keeping SU back to deliver the pragmatic impact? Um, there's comments coming through like SU being capacitated to deliver on social impact. Um, we need to move from dialogue to implementation and follow through. It then should become responsibility of all staff, processes, systems, students, etc., to be active participants in transformation for social impact. And then there is a question that just came through now. How do you monitor the quality of teaching and learning and research at WITS? How do you con currently measure impact and engagement in these academic processes and to what extent did WITS do research on the assumptions of engagement as outcome of excellence in teaching and learning and research? And they say, and if you have any references, you're welcome to provide in this regard. 
Thank you very much, Siobhan. Let's move on to Dr. Johnson. Bernadette, um, I directed at you, perhaps also allude to the fact that uh, uh, around moving from uh, a scenario of dialogue into actions, I think to an extent you've alluded to that earlier on, um, and also um, the teaching and learning aspect. So um, the VITS 2033 vision um, says it, it, it explicitly indicates that it's overarching. So achieving social impact throughout VITS is history and we have harnessed our knowledge for social good and have been the university at the forefront of it addressing challenges. So the specific areas um, that it wants to focus its active role in is climate change, inequality, public health and social justice. Why I mention this is it's the overarching function. So it will inevitably come out in all the reporting in the university where teaching and learning has happened. And um, uh, for example, um, the research translates into teaching and learning. These are all excellent examples. There's many um, a Nobel Prize winners at WITS, you know, the people who have studied at WITS. There's like Mandela himself and all the anti-apartheid, lots of the anti, many of the EFF leaders have studied at WITS. So um, including Dali Mapofo. So there's a lot of leading people. Tomorrow we start our home homecoming celebration, 100 years. So the alumni from all over the world will probably will be descending upon WITS and there will be a people's concert. So it's in the when I say it's in the DNA, I mean that it, it happens anyway, because the people who come here think in that way. When they're doing their research, when they're doing their teaching and learning, they think how how I want to mention an auntie of mine. So this is a real person, Auntie Katie. So when I come to work, I must think about how is this work I'm doing going to help Auntie Katie? Mm. We all have aunties. That's the question we must ask. And I've got an aunt and I go to her and ask her, what do you think about what we do? And they're like, what are you doing? And when you start to get real practical and you say, actually, you know, your children, we did this automatically during COVID. We bought laptops and we used the post office and delivered them, that social justice. We bought the students data. It's not a question. You couldn't get access to data. It's in the DNA. We love social justice. We've got hungry students. We know what to do at Stellenbosch. You just have to look around and say, what can we do to make the place better? How many hungry students do we have? Do we need to bowl? Do we, do we need to grow pretty plants or do, do we need to grow fruit trees? Thank you very much, uh, Benedict. In fact, absolutely giving real stature to um, uh, going from dialogue to actions by, you know, interacting and engaging on to Katie. Um, that's exactly how you take your social impact and, and, and moving it over into some form of activity. Uh, Karen, on your side, um, uh, I'm not sure about your alumni and how powerful they are. Um, suffice to say, it's very impressive coming from bits. Um, but um, you have an auntie Katie in your midst. How do you go from um, uh, dialogue into actions? Um, yes, we do have an Auntie Katie in our midst. Um, at the moment, I'm visiting Kwakwa campus and to have engagement with um, our colleagues on Engage Scholarship. But this morning at the guest house, um, the lady asked, so what is community engagement? What do you do? What is that? How, do, how is that part of the university? And for the first time, I was able to explain to her in one sentence, because for me, that has always been very difficult. And so I had to allude to that we do have engaged teaching and learning and engaged research that we do at the university, but the engaged is where the, the, the real engagement, the real action comes in. And how do we do that? We do that through our engaged teaching and learning, and we do that through our engaged research. But definitely, again, as I imagined and as I uh, already mentioned about the establishment of community university research partnerships and where we now focus on training the community and the academics, the next generation to do community based research. And that is coming to the real action of working towards social impact. 
Yes, and definitely also not only listening to the Auntie Katie and not only speaking to the Auntie Katie, but speaking to the students that is in our university who are the our um, main stakeholders and our clients in the university and having conversation with them about how do we do social impact? How do we enact towards social impact? And then linking that to the co-curricular programs and the extracurricular programs um, in extension of the curricular service learning that we do and where we engage with community. And um, we also have the example of our a uh, rural collaborative learning platform also alluding to let's take the university to society which we refer to as a mini campus of the university for there is where true engagement is while students are learning in collaboration in a well i would say a microcosm a small community in the sense of students um, learning from and with the community and then also addressing the societal challenges that they have there in the community. So where the, let's say, the tar hits the road, that is where it needs to take place. Truly really remarkable. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, Mr. Sampondo, Kwan Dakele, moving over to you. Now, my question to you, given and the point was made by Bernadette and very imperative uh, with regards to the issue of language, um, you are midst of an Afrikaans, uh, if I can call that a due respect, province sailing from the Eastern Cape. So Isibulu might be uh, a wee bit strange or foreign to you, but that's where you work and that's where you play. Um, how much do you think in your actions of uh, accessing this and accessing that and venturing into communities and affecting social impact? How much of that goes lost in translation? No, oh, thank you, thank you so much, Jerome. Kijk, ik 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 probeer Afrikaans praat en jelle kan me nooit kenner in Afrikaans. So I had to teach myself, uh, and I'm here learning the language. And uh, I'm also, you know, I tutor Sichuana. I had to learn those languages. Um, if you are here in Northern Cape, and I think that's also part of just respecting the people. Um, it's important that you, 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 for you to get to the people, you've got to understand the language of the people. Um, but I had, um, because you see Benedette mentioned this thing, um, the, the challenge of why Africana kids uh, choose um, Techies and Stellenbosch uh, instead of Reds. And, and uh, Karen, um, you're talking about engaging Kwakwa. Now, the, 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 and this thing has always been interesting to me, you know, how does these um, um, diverse university or predominantly diverse university, um, uh, like Free State and them, engage African community? How do you engage the white group? Is, is engagement um, solely focused on the poor communities? Um, and and if the engagement with them is only through uh, getting their resources, how do we get them to participate in the business of the university? I I, I wanted to ask that question because I heard you you speaking about um, Kwa Kwa. Um, please park it um, because the the answer that I wanted to give to you, Jerome, about language is that in Northern Cape, one thing, and again, it is this resilience that I don't think we we contextualize. Um, it, it is in Northern Cape where you will find a, a Chwana family having Afrikaans as first language. Mm. It is in Northern Cape where you'll find a Sutu family having Afrikaans. As, and, and for me, that represented resilience through language. Um, you have, you have, you have such in Northern Cape. And I mean, you've got Nama, you've got Koi and everyone, people using language to engage and 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 they build resilience uh, with that. So that's 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 just the point I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you for the context, but you still haven't answered my question. I asked you how much of whatever you are doing is not perceived or understood by your communities where you work? Look, the... The, the the issue about um, being misunderstood um, it happens because in the in the point of this collaborative agency we always talk about the role of the initiator 
Um, what we find there is that those that tend to initiate, the, because the, the initiation of the collaboration cannot be one-sided. And that's the point I was talking about, about inclusion. So I find that the expectation, when the expectation is greater um, in Northern Cape um, specifically, where expectation is that university is going to create employment, uh, university is going to give tenders because we're building, university is going, and there, because we don't find each other because the expectation is greater and that's not really what we are engaging for. Sometimes we lose each other in that context. Before we go on to Bruce, just finally from my side on this topic, do you find that you engage on a personal level? Do you also have an Auntie Katie in your midst? Yeah, look, engaging at personal level is is fine um, um, because I I think it becomes better here. Um, but again, it is transitioning from getting their understanding of what um, they 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 expect from the university and finding each other. Yeah, Bruce Lamons. I mean, I think you would have the same scenario in your neck of the woods where you'd find that uh, mixed or brown, if you will, households would be more um, fluent or um, uh, conversant in Isikosa than than perhaps Afrikaans to an extent, and then Isingesi as well. Um, but with reference to your personal uh, uh, re outreach programs, do you really come on a personal level with your communities, impacting uh, significantly? The question of whether significantly some of the tension that has been raised by partners in that reflection that we have, um, I think we we engage intimately. And, the, and we are reimagining a, a more converged approach. Because we mustn't forget that I think universities are, are partly complicit to some of the historical and contemporary challenges we are faced. So we should not behave as the Messiah now and we, we carry this historical baggage. And hence, I think the reposition of intention. And I think Prof. Komedi put it quite nicely when he said, uh, when he, said he, he, he flipped uh, the um, Prof. de Valier's statement to say, should we be moving from more corporate citizenship to more democratic citizenship. And that requires, I think, a strong shift of intention. But then we have to also then match that with some of the historical, I think, architectures that might prevent us from achieving what we're setting out to do in this conversation. One of them is the recognition of the engagement mandate in the university against the other mandates, because I see there's a number of questions that colleagues have been asking so that we move away from the token recognition of an award to a really deep immersed acknowledgement that this actually adds deep meaningful value to real change and then when we talk of reimagination so the tensions that you speak about externally is internally as well hence we move to form the hubs of convergence and what we recognize it's more it, the, the hubs are actually playing a very strong facilitatory role between the different philosophical, ideological, and historical type of architectures that we have to mitigate as we move towards a reimagination. So what we tend to do, Jerome, almost when we go out to our communities and even in some of, 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 of the more complex spaces within the unit, is almost to do a bit of an AA, Alcoholics Anonymous activity, where before you can speak in, the, in, in, in an AA meeting, um, is you have to admit that you're an alcoholic, and then, and as soon as you admit in that space, everyone rallies around you and they say, great Bruce, now you're here. How can we help? How can we work? And I think that's the the, the type of, of culture that we, we, we want to encourage is that we're all complicit in some way. We caught in a fantastic historical moment of bringing um, substantial change. And then also have the the ability because we were critiqued in the, in this workshop about having a thin skin when it comes to engage because our communities are tired of us as coming into the space and coming as the messiah. So what we also do now is also then request institute what we term in institutional grace. Say please, we're really trying to think. Yes, we complicit, we understand, but can you give us a bit of space to real because we really want to immerse. And, and I can tell you there's a richness of grace within our communities that's willing to learn. I think the challenge still is the systemic things and we need to think and collaborate and encourage this hybrid model of engagement and learn from one another as, we, as I'm learning today in this particular space as well. Well, thank you very much, Bruce Diamonds there. And um, 
it'll be rhetorical of me to ask whether you have your own Auntie Katie, because I mean, you engage on an intimate level. Yeah, so Mama's, Zabuka, part... Mama's Zabuka is my Auntie Katie, and, I, so and, you, and you throw Henrietta. Both there we go, but I'm, in our space here. <laughs> but I'm yet to be convinced that um, university uh, personnel and academics do not have thin skins. Um, I'm very much convinced that that is exactly the case. Um, Aman Bam, we're going to come back to you before we go to uh, Siobhan and uh, field some questions. Siobhan? Thank you, Jerome. Um, a, a question that came up, and I want to just applaud the panel as well as the audience for responding to comments in the in the chat. Um, <clears throat> but something that came up um, that I think was of value is the comment that was made by Dr. Barnes. She understands the need to explore and reimagine social impact, but we also need to explore why social impact is not counted or considered as academic outputs. Academic staff are in most cases measured by the academic outputs. Um, to follow on from that was a comment um, by Dr. Cleofas, a foundational problem that was identified during the struggle years was whiteness, not white people. So emphasizing demographics redress as a as social impact intervention without unpacking whiteness, no decolonization happens. Thank you, Jerome. Is that it? Thank you very much. Um, I see this movement uh, before we move on to, or do you want to, uh, respond, uh, Armand, or should we go to Dr. Fenter? Um, Dr. Fenter can go ahead. I think I would like to um, extend that invitation to Dr. Johnson because I think mm -hmm. she can um, elaborate Absolutely. on that. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Johnson, Bernadette? What, what should I? Yeah, well, no, Dr. Cleopas, through the uh, listen ahead, you know, the, the issue of whiteness versus white people and uh, where the argument emanates, and now we deal with that. And Dr. Barnes, prior to that, also uh, about social impact not being considered as an academic output. But, but Bernadette, I think the former, more the former than the latter. Yeah, Bernadette, if you don't mind, if I can address um, uh, Ms. Barnes, uh, Dr. Barnes' notion of research and um, where social impact fits in, and then I think uh, um, you can address the. the Please issue go ahead, Dr. Bam, and then we'll move over yeah. to, to so, Dr. Johnson. In my experience, uh, Dr. Barnes is, is, is hitting the nail on the head here. When you look at how it is that people are rewarded within an institution like this, Research output is number one. Um, within our faculty, we've had many debates about coming to a, a, at least a coherent and collective understanding of social impact. And the place where we experience the greatest irritation and bottlenecking is around this notion of where social impact fits in on this continuum of being evaluated as a contribution to the institution. And it is research teaching and learning, and then this add-on of social impact. You know, for me, the particular issue of um, doing any research, it has to result in that societal impact. But too often researchers make the claim. You know, you see these uh, proposals that uh, um, to do research, to conduct research in communities, and the claim is it will deliver social impact. But we never get to that point of understanding what that social impact actually is. But what does happen is that the researcher gets another notch um, on their belt. And if you get enough credits, you get promoted. And mm -hmm. that is what needs to be re-engineered here. And it requires bravery and courage within an institution like this to address the issue of how we value social impact. And I want to say there isn't that bravery and courage to say that what our endeavor is towards is delivering that social justice. That should be what we should be putting our attention to, to addressing issues of inequality through our research, through our teaching and learning. Um, but to make these claims that we're delivering social impact through research, I mean, it's 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 a, at times it's ludicrous where you see where people are publishing. They're publishing in the journals that they themselves <laughs> um, put together. And, and so we have to be far more self-critical about this aspect of how do we value social impact with an institution um, 
like ours. Thank you. Dr. Johnson. Thank you. So whiteness, um, I think uh, you would, uh, uh, the way I see it is that it's got to do with consciousness um, and it's got to be just draw on the work of Steve Biko. Um, and so when we're dealing with this in the example, I may mention to you two black women, one accusing the other one of patriarching, being patriarchal and acting like a white male. So that's the form that racism conversations <laughs> or challenges take place or complaints take. It's a very interesting format, but it's, it's, it's not overt. It's, it's these kind of implicit engagements that people have. Um, in instances like that, we, we would do uh, conversations, difficult conversations, often in a, I would even consider if both parties are interested, alternative dispute resolution, and that is really doing, engaging in a mediated process. The focus really is to unearth the underpinning assumptions of what makes you think in a particular way, what has the person done, and going deeper and deeper and deeper so that at the end of it, uh, both parties understand and have expressed the forms that patriarchal has taken. So, for example, people talking over each other can be experienced as you dominating over me and you behaving like a white patriarchal male. And I'm using those words because that is you triggered me in thinking about the principal at my school who never gave me a chance to talk and used to beat me corporal punishment. So it it uh, we we deal with it's interesting because in these cases, like William says, it, it brings out the importance you cannot deal with looking at yourself without going to the at the institution without going to the self. What you so Johnson, to the institution and what sure. do they bring to that space? Yeah. I want to I want to pose the following question and uh, would beg re responses from all of you because we're moving towards the end of our interaction. We have about um, a few minutes left, I think just more than 10 minutes if memory serves, and then we need to hand over to our um, the person that will be doing the closing remarks, Dr. Leslie Van Roy. Uh, do you find that in, in having engaged now for, for, for a significant space of time and getting a sense of what it is exactly that we busy ourselves within our respective institutions, and how we, 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 we roll them out. Um, do you think there's room for improvement? Do you think there's, there's really anything that we need to cut off and that's something we can go and learn from one another? Or are we on the right trajectory? Do we, are we, are we, we shouldn't be in, intimidated in any event, in any way, um, by anyone else, any other institution, um, et cetera. So, so, so do you think there was a big, nice melting pot of um, skill sets here? Or is there really a great need here, based on whatever <laughs> internal conflicts that we can take hands and work together? Never minding the entrepreneurial or the competitive advantage or the market share that will be lost in the process. Let me start with you, Bruce Diamond. Can we please just mute the microphones? Thank you. Uh, the question was quite clear, Bruce Dammons. Yeah, no, it's quite clear. Definitely, I, I, I don't think um, as Nelson Mandela University at any stage do we want to claim that we have the the um, the the appropriate type of responses for the complexity faced in society, not even the university society. And I think as when we converge in these ways, uh, and that's why I want to express the my our appreciation for inviting us to to sit in the space and actually learn with you around these complex methods. And I think it's then how we complement one another with the E in these processes instead of competing with one another that I think will allow us to be um, more, I use this words very reluctantly, efficiently and effective in responding to some of these wicked problems that we that all of society is confronted because we are all institutions of South Africa. We're not located anywhere else. And so when we when we have that demographic uh, that demographic breakdown of the specific contextual challenges, it's through, throughout this country. It's throughout this country. It's not located in only one geographic and it's confronting the majority of our people wherever they find themselves. And so, for example, if you go to St. Lowry's Pass, I had the privilege of visiting the, that community-based organization twice. It's a melting pot of opportunity to learn with the community. It's such a complex type of situation there. And to see communities, intellectuals, scholars, 
That's what I call. We are all we, we question this notion of who has the right to be claim themselves as a scholar, whose knowledge matters in trying to co-construct solutions to this. How is that knowledge shared? How is that knowledge celebrated? How is it recognized as was raised as well? And so I think these are processes of sense making for us, these conversations. Um, sitting in our tensions, being comfortable to sit in that tension and in sometimes personal contradictions. You see, because I have to remind myself whenever I go to working class, socio-economic, marginalized working class communities that I'm middle class. I have to remind myself of that when I sit and engage in a way that needs to be meaningful and impactful as well. So that's the tension we we sit in with, with Mandela University and we're really open to collaborating and working with all our colleagues across the space in making sense. How do we develop uh, contextually relevant responses to some of these complexities faced by society and our institutions? Thanks, Joe. Thank you very much, Bruce Damons. I mean, you've alluded to Salary Spouse Village now a number of times, and I need to stress that that must be one of the most beautiful views and sights looking out over the Valdeberg Basin into Falls Bay. Uh, well, I get to see it almost every day, apart from uh, you. But someone who also sees it more often than you is uh, Armand Bam. Dr. Bam? Yes, I, th I think in, in concluding and just to tie into um, what Dr. Diamonds was, was alluding to, I think at best we are the custodians in some ways of knowledge, but we really are there to co-construct knowledge. And this notion of owning knowledge is something we have to disavow ourselves of. It, it is our job to take the universities towards the people. Um, and, and I'd like Let me to, interrupt you there. Let me interrupt you there. Because that's a that's a profound and a vital point you are making, taking it the opportunities to the people. Let's look at if you want to look at it from a second economy viewpoint, you can. But what about indigenous business? You're a businessman. I mean, you that's where you play. What about Buta Achis? He's been a, a walker all his life. He's put his children through school, through university from walking on a bucky, selling produce, selling fish, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the acknowledgement that he, that he had, because the sense I get that Buta Achis of the, of the world would still be having uh, this look down upon scenario, et cetera, and that the minority complex is, 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 is instilled with the children as well. And that's how they, and then they, they go into the situation where they don't acknowledge father for having put them through that. I'm generalizing. But my question again to you, what is the university, in this case, Salamash University, doing to stimulate indigenous business? Well, that's a tough one. But um, maybe in response, I think what I would like to encourage is that we adopt more of an outlook of being social constructivist. It's that notion that we're generating knowledge together. I think that's the first point of call in terms of dismantling these hierarchies and power dynamics. And when you speak about the Buddha Ahi, um, I think there's, there's two dimensions to that. We as a people as well need to understand the value of our lived experience and the knowledge that it contributes in a space like a university. And we try really hard, I think as a university, and I, I'll speak from a business school perspective, to dismantle those barriers, to break down those 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 those. Um, really those those barriers to being included in the space. It takes a lot of work. We didn't answer the question about why white people come to Stellenbosch, um, you know. Are we getting to it? We're getting to it. Yes, you were touching on it. Well, you know, and, and in some ways, you know, we have to understand these issues. We do understand it. It's the same reason why black students feel averse to coming to Stellenbosch culturally. You know, we have these debates about what the university represents, and we don't do enough work to dismantle that. Racism what does it represent? What does Sorry? it represent? What does it represent in your view? Privilege. That's what it represents. Right. And you can so easily, as black academics, fall into the trap of building up that privilege. We need to unshackle that bondage in some ways and you know i don't have the answer for everybody but this university let's understand but beyond the notion of privilege what annoys me most about how it is and the critique at stellenbosch university is fair it is 
Right, it is coming from all directions and it has to continue. What annoys me most about that is what we lack to, what it is that we lack to see in terms of the potential that a university like Stellenbosch University has. It has massive potential to shift the dynamics in the communities around us. We know who controls the economy. We know who's associated and supporting the university. We need to do the work to explain to those people, to our stakeholders, what value they can contribute to the future of this country just by shifting the way that they look at what that university represents. I'd, and love, to explore. Have... I'd yeah. love to explore. We know who and who those who is, etc. Time is not going to allow us to, but that begs another interesting engagement perhaps for the next time, Dr. Bam. I want to finish off with you, Dr. Johnson, moving over to Mr. Sampondo. I've lost him on the screen for a short while. In the meantime, we have to, we had to greet Dr. Fenter because she had another engagement and um, she had expressed her best wishes uh, to all of us and the gratitude. Mr. Sampondo, are you with us? Yes, I'm still here. I'm still here. Well, and Kele Sampondo, your take home message and also perhaps the issue on on the table currently as a take home. Um, th thank you so much, Jerome. And um, th I think the point that I want to, in fact, because you alluded to it earlier, um, you know, in reference to what um, Dr. Baum was talking about being in Northern Cape where you were creeping in each other's territory. And the point I'm trying to make there, I'm saying uh, there's an opportunity that avails itself um, to really drive the point I was making about collaborative agency, because um, achieving social impact has got no name tag, it's not attached to anyone. And, 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 and I think we're missing out on opportunities to collaborate. And, I, and we are doing that. And I think some of the colleagues from the central universities are here. Um, and and we've been doing that a lot, um, you know, the uh, community engagement office from CUT and um, Karen from your office. And I think for me, that's the point. There's so much we can achieve together if we can collaborate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sampondo. Um, Dr. Benedict Johnson. So I just wanted to say, Dr. Bam, I think what you meant was white privilege um, at WITS, where what we what I would think more of as black privilege. And um, and I think these are the complexities of our country that we're dealing with. And the more we talk about that in our sensitization work, we talk about power and privilege. So, yes, you have privilege, but what do you do with that privilege? What power do you have and how do you listen and what do you do it for? None of us are going anywhere. Maybe there's someone, people who are going overseas. We're not. Um, people at Stellenbosch aren't, UP aren't, <laughs> and WITS aren't, and UCT aren't. Our contradictions are going to be there. The point is, how do we include, how do we bridge? We have to do this. And one of the things I think maybe WITS is, 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 is missing out on is the organizational development learning when you engage, con when you engage in a way which is systematically organized. And this is what I'm hearing from um, Dr. Damons and, and, and other colleagues. There's a, there's, there's a learning, there's a systematic organizational learning. And I think critically in the context of a failed state, we are very fortunate that we are autonomous, that we must fight and defend autonomy. We must fight and defend academic freedom. We must not let that be taken away. It's only on the basis of that that universities will be an alternative beacon for our society. Dr. Benedict Johnson, thank you very much to conclude on that positive note. I beg the question again there. Not sure why we still need to fight about certain things. Have we not gone past that? Uh, where we just now interact and engage about things, suffice to say that they still need to fight about a lot of things. The message I get now, I came into the discussion with an open mind, open head, um, not knowing anything about social impact. What I'm leaving here with is identifying those key drivers of social impact. Number one is opportunities. Opportunities need to be created and to be taken. And then also there need to be clear goals in where you're moving with those and achieving those opportunities. There must be passion that drives that also. And there must be a robust interaction. The mindset must be very, very specific. And who can affect social impact apart from places of higher learning, such as 
people uh, your, uh, such as yourselves in very important um, capacities. Uh, there are those entrepreneurs, whether they are capitalists, whether they are social entrepreneurs, they need to play an important role, and they will. There are those, um, the, the corporates, the commodities, um, etc., and, and all else organizations, whether those are MPOs, NGOs, and so on. And of course, also government, all tiers of government. I say that last, and I want to say it very softly because they also need to sort out their own lives. I uh, hazard to say, mess. Lady and gentlemen, it has been a wonderful engagement with you. I'm looking forward to our next interaction. On that note, allow me to thank you. Do not go away. I'm going to hand over to Dr. Leslie Van Roy. He is the Senior Director for Social Impact and Transformation at the University to do the closing remarks. Thank you very much, Jerome and colleagues. Now, uh, Jerome, I must comment that uh, I think you're back in your radio uh, chair and seat today. Uh, so it's also good to see that part of your life uh, coming back to the fore. Absolutely fantastic to see everyone again. It feels a bit like a, a reunion. Uh, our panelists, Bernie, Bruce, Armand, Kondokela, uh, uh, Karen, etc. Um, and a number of our, our executive members of the executive faculty committees for social impact represented here social impact champions at the university in the look of building some of our closest community partners, those that engage with the university. And Bernie, we always remind ourselves between the two of us when we engage, I think it was you made the comment that uh, uh, the allowing that we, we should allow our communities onto our campuses and or uh, that that bridge or, or gate uh, sometimes disallows that now, of course, as, as you know, on this side, uh, it is an open walkable campus, uh, so that expression uh, takes on a different uh, form on this side. Colleagues, perhaps for me, um, in, in closing, uh, to say that the theme has a very particular meaning for us at Stellenbosch University. It comes after um, the um, start of a process to integrate the historic NGO of our university into the division uh, for social impact within the broader frame of social impact and transformation. When we started that process, we realized that indeed this institution is shifting, it is transforming, uh, indeed it is changing, and that we have to think again about what we mean uh, by and with and through social impact and how it affects ourselves as an institution and indeed also how uh, we engage with our publics, science for society, uh, transformation in and through the institution. And in doing that, we embarked on a long process, uh, and I must admit we are still partly in that progress, uh, a, a process, uh, and that is a process that we use to uncover, rediscover, and indeed explore where we are as an institution, who we are as an institution, and what it indeed means for this institution uh, to be busy uh, with its publics and for this university to become a fully engaged university. And that really is the DNA question, Bernie, that you spoke about and really uh, that all of our speakers uh, spoke about. I think the conversation led in by the vice chancellor this morning on the notion uh, of the so-called fifth wave uh, in higher education is a pertinent one uh, that indeed uh, came through quite sharply in the discussions today. And that is uh, that universities all across the world and the globe is moving away from the notion of only being research intensive for the sake of doing research, uh, and that we're moving towards universities that really is inherently in service of society. And where engagement, social impact is not something that happens in a silo, where teaching and learning is not separate and separated from research, and indeed where research is not something different from teaching and learning, where these things are enmeshed in an understanding of being university that brings about change. That is what I think we should be working towards, and that is the aim of a discussion and engagement around what it means to reimagine the idea of social impact at this university. It can no longer be a siloed understanding, it cannot be a us and them understanding, and it cannot be a university separated from its publics internally and externally. It cannot be part of that. Our panel reminded us that our universities are quite different. We have different stories. 
we have different histories, etc. And of course, and I think you concluded on, on, on that, that note linked to your last question, Jerome, that is also that there is something unique about our universities. I, I'm really not interested in a territory conversation. Uh, we are universities for South Africa. We are public institutions. We must link up and link up more uh, and, and, and should not talk about or think of ourselves as, as territorial. But our histories and stories matter, and it is quite important for us to delve into that. So, Stellenbosch University is not an island. Stellenbosch University is part of the landscape of higher education. It is part of the landscape of this town and this province. It is part of the nature and being uh, of where we are here. But Stellenbosch University also has a very specific context, and that context came up a number of times in the discussion here, and it will remain part of the discussion. I agree with you, Armand. It is important for us to utilize and to make sense of the criticism towards the institution, because it must compel us to think not only of how we transform and enact transformation in and through the university, but ideally also how we understand restitution and how we enact restitution. And a lot of the comments shared in the chat function alluded to that, and a number of the comments made up to now, uh, and in the reimagination process has also alluded to that. And restitution for this university will in the first instance have to be closely linked uh, to the town and the communities that make up Stellenbosch, and of course the towns and communities around where we find our campuses. That will be the litmus test, how we engage to bring about restitutive, meaningful, uh, deliberate change that will allow the uh, perhaps not physical borders of the university, uh, but the almost historically build up doors to the university to indeed be open and to allow for engagement. And that will ask for the university to think new about, well, to remember and historically acknowledge its, its DNA, but indeed also for the university to, do, to be very deliberate about its DNA going forward. The critique is welcomed. The acknowledgement on what a number of colleagues do also alluded in some of the examples here must be celebrated, but it must lead to an institution uh, where indeed an office for engagement and office for transformation should not be necessary because it is part of the nature of the work that we do. But we are not there. And therefore, the role of this office and the role of this environment must be to prompt through policy and practice an understanding of an engagement that will indeed lead this institution uh, to understand its inherent nature. And that is that it should be a community, a university community in service of society, that it indeed should showcase the nature of what it means to be a fifth wave uh, type of institution. And that is a, 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 um, a progression and understanding and a reflection that really comes deeply close to the soul of what a university is and should be and to the soul uh, of this institution. It can best be done and perhaps ultimately be done through an understanding of what it means to engage what it means to allow knowledge transfer, what it means to make society better, and what it will allow uh, and perhaps force uh, of, of institutions like Stellenbosch University to not only reflect on its history, but to acknowledge and deeply allow itself to be changed also by its communities and publics to indeed be the true asset that our university should be and continuously aims to be more and more uh, as a university in service of society. In that sense, this conversation is, is present not only here where I am at Stellenbosch, in the town of Stellenbosch, it most definitely is present in the center of Joburg, it is uh, present in Teberga, it is present in Kimberley, Kondokela, uh, it is present in Springbok, Armand, that you mentioned, and it must be present and more and more present in the conversations uh, that uh, we have and the actions uh, that we enact and do and are asked uh, to engage on in our most local communities 
including those uh, that through the so-called borders of our society mix and move uh, to be fully part uh, of the nature and the purpose of this institution. And I thank you for the fact, Jerome, that we can be part of this conversation, a national one, and that the national conversation has helped us to reflect even more closely uh, to what restitution means here and indeed uh, to what extent engagement and social impact can be the impetus, the driver and the energy, of course, uh, of restitution. That is possible. And Armand, you reminded us that we are in the ideal position to make that possible. Let's make it work. Thanks, colleagues. Thank you very much for being here. In fact, we have made it work to a large extent. Thank you very much, Dr. Leslie van Roy, for the closing remarks, very accurate as well. Uh, we have mixed and now we need to move. I want to thank each of you again, all our panelists, our keynote speaker in his absence, also Dr. Fenter in her absence, and my back office support led by Siobhan, but under the, uh, um, the stewardship of uh, Professor Wim de Villiers, uh, Vice uh, Chancellor and Director, as well as the guidance of our Director at Social Impact, Ernestine, um, Adams, uh, Ernestine Mayer Adams. Thank you to all. Until next time, goodbye.